This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Then I can have the focus to start the station because, again, I don't want it to just be some joker sitting on his bed yeah. with a cheap microphone. I want it to be a real radio experience. No, I like that. I like that when you first get going on something, it's like, let's do this properly or not at all, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and um, I am not a believer in excessive planning. However, I do want to see things started and conducted mm-hmm. and finished right. properly. Right. You know, so um, call it military precision. I want that kind of precision in everything I do. It's, it's pride in one's work, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have the same thing with stand up. All stand up comics have that, I believe. You know, we're not going to record a special. Uh, until we feel that we're ready to record yeah. a special. Yeah. You don't just give it a shot. You have to prepare. It has to be in place. Yeah. No, I'm pu- not putting anything online unless it's something I'm done with and yeah. that I, per- you know, figured I can't push any further. Yeah, I agree with you on that. It's so irritating how many people want to record us when we're up there. Do they? <laughs> I, I could name a few names. There's some of us in the stand-up world who record themselves and others. Right. And I don't, I, I don't get that. I've always found that when people put stuff up on Instagram and stuff, they're really good about cutting off so that you don't get the full joke or anything. It's just like a little tag or something. A sample. Yeah, yeah. You make people thirsty for the for the punchline. Yeah, you don't. Cu- yeah, you don't spoil the material. Yeah. yeah. But there's a quite a few times I saw people, you know, with their cell phones turned on, uh, but I would just roast them. You know, right. how dare you, you know, record yeah. this when I'm not ready. I'm not recording you yeah. when you're on the toilet in the morning getting ready for your day. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to record you when you're ready to be presented. Yeah. You know, you're a writer. I'm not shipping out your first drafts. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, I mentioned respecting the art yeah. uh, to me. That is a form of respect, uh, disrespecting the, the art when people are up there recording stuff. And again, I've seen, I've seen fellow comics doing that, uh, recording other comics bits and I, I it's highly suspect i've been tempted at times to do that but just because it's like i know somebody who's not in the circuit this bit is gonna this bit, bit is gonna go out of rotation before they even see them and it's like i want to but I, i've never done it because it does feel wrong i get what you're saying yeah yeah I totally get what you're saying. you know if 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 the comic is ready for it to be recorded great yeah. but if the comic is not yeah. to me it's a sign of disrespect yeah you know uh you have a lot of uh people who um you know, they get a little pissy when they talk about like Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock or whoever. They gather up people's cell phones before right. they go on stage. I think that's ah. completely in line with that whole thing about respecting the art. Yeah. If they, you know, if they're going to record a, a, a comedy special, um, who's to say that it's not within the comics' right to prohibit that special being put out online before they release it? That's money out of their pocket. Have we started, by the way? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even introduce... You guys know this guy. This is Eirik Servik. He, uh, you know, that's so irritating. When I push, when I put the uh, graphic, you know, with my guest, Eirik Servik, there is no... On, on the program that I use, there's, there's no... No, uh, uh, no. so it's... Uh, I hope you know. I, I do what? know it's... <laughs> Seinfeld did a bit about weird taxi drivers' names in, in New York, and he referred to that as the symbol for boron, I believe. The symbol for boron. <laughs> No, you so gotta find that. Yeah. Every, you guys know who Eidek is. This is what your fourth, fifth appearance. Fourth, something, something like something, that. Yeah. yeah, you're one of the you're one of my uh, top guests, man. People uh, like you. I'm a reg. I'm not up there with like the likes of Tiffany and stuff, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> Tiffany holds the record. She's been <laughs> yeah. on God. Has she been on ten times or more? Probably. 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 Yeah. Well, I have 180 episodes. This will be 181. Uh, I'm I'm kicking them out, man. There was a while where I was slowing down. Uh, you know, uh, Corona blazed a path through this household here. Yeah. I didn't get it. Yeah. Officially. Officially. I think I got it. I think I had it though. Yeah. Even though I tested negative all the time. Um, I, I'm feeling stuff that people would call that long COVID. Yeah. That after effect of COVID. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling that now. Um, whatever. Yeah. So COVID was blazing a trail through this house and I just kind of slowed down with uh, the podcast and because I like when people come. Yeah, here you know. No, the it's first so couple much of, better. The first couple of times I did it from afar, and uh, yeah, it's just way nicer when it's there's fun. No, but this is better. Yeah. This is better. The tiny, I mean, a comedian would know, right? Like the tiny little delays and stuff. They'll yeah. throw you throw yeah. off a rapport. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, if you know, if the if the internet connection is a little choppy and stuff, and it ju- it yeah. just 
It just kills the vibe. And when I listen back, I'd be jealous because your auto quality would be crisp and mine would be <laughs> potato. Well, you know, I gotta, uh -huh. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rise above, you know. But yeah, no, it's nice to be back, uh, man. I yeah, man, it. it's been a while. It took us a long time to make this happen, but um, but here we are. What's new in the world of Eidic? Oh, it's the same as always, man. Are Up, you... <laughs> down, round, and round. Up, down, around, and around. Yeah, I can never give like a good, I can never give a short answer and be like, no, I'm good. I'm, good. <laughs> I'm waiting for that short answer. Yeah. I'm, I'm good, man. I don't do those. No, it's, uh, this year's been weird. It's been like a, a season of House MD for me. Like it's been <laughs> one health complication <laughs> after the other in the beginning. And it was annoying because I I I, uh, I started working out last summer, Anthony. Uh, you were well on your way to some really really honest physical changes. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were working hard. Yeah, no, I am, and I'm up to since the turn of the year. I'm up to like five times a week. I go out uh, That's great, to the gym, man. rest days on Mondays and Fridays. And That's great. It's it's uh, it's. I wish I'd done this in my twenties because I I have this thing where I don't like going to bed because the sooner i go to bed the sooner the next day is here and god not another day and uh working out makes me go like well i i do want to work out in the morning that is fun that gives me energy and i want to be rested for it so it's easier to fall asleep now you know you there's so many benefits to having yeah. a regular training routine one is that mental satisfaction i've done something for my body but mm. again that physical thing that kicks in that you know you're putting your body in this it's a stressed condition when we train and we and we progress with yeah. strength training, but it's 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 that good kind of stress, but that stress also puts the body in rest mode, mm. so that sleep is a lot better if you have that constant training routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's it's uh it's been a huge game changer. If I'd done that in my twenties, I would have been a different guy. I think I would have completed my degree. I think because it just gives me a schedule to stick to, and it make, it gives me it does something with your thought process. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you have a much Po more positive outlook on yeah. all things yeah. when you're in shape when you're strong and fit and healthy yeah yeah no yeah. it's it's uh way overdue i'm so glad that anthony dragged me in the beginning it was hard man because i had to work against my own brain so much like my <laughs> my brain would be trying really hard to stop me from going to the gym yeah it would be and and uh, there was there was a period where it was like really hard and i was pushing myself to go and i'd notice the ramping up of my brain when i got closer to the studio i would get more and more mean to myself yeah, yeah and be like what the, why are you doing this you idiot you know you suck you're gonna die alone anyway yeah, you know all that stuff yeah. and it just got more and more intense and then i crossed the threshold to the gym and it's like boop, gone so how is it now do you still no now it's you're not easy. plagued by that negative process when it comes to training no it can be hard you're, to push myself out the door but once i'm out the door it's like that happens to everybody yeah yeah. yeah 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 but There's, not no it's a, it's a totally change for me now and i had a i, I got covid in february i think yeah and that was like a couple of weeks or no, a week out. And then it took a while before I, you know, started feeling really good again. And then after that, I got a back issue. Like, uh, oh, really? Yeah, I'm around my shoulder. It, and it was like, it wasn't even from lifting. It wasn't like I did a deadlift and like snap. It was, <laughs> I was sitting at a bench at a meeting at work, just oh, sitting man. and just twang. And I'm like, oh no, that's a thing. Oh. And, uh, and then, okay, out for another week. And then it, it just, uh, uh, and then you get back and it's like, man, I got to lift 30 kilos less than earlier. That's crazy how quick you lose that. It is, but it's also crazy how quick it comes back. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I don't know, you know, uh, I, I never want to preach. I never want to try and coerce people into anything, but I do like putting good information out there and it is good information that it can change your life. In so many ways, if you people, you can change your life in yep. so many ways if yep. you have a consistent, um, realistic training routine. Let's do an infomercial. I used to be a slob for twenty years, <laughs> but then I started lifting. Oh yeah, we should. Do. <laughs> no, but it's it's. Um, Jim Shark, give me where? Yeah. Well, you know, and it becomes a lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. It, it stops being something. Oh gosh, I have to do this. It becomes something that is part of your lifestyle, and you don't even think of it. Now my main thing though is I don't want to have people think I'm a Brendan Schaub or a oh. <laughs> Joe Rogan. Oh. <laughs> I'm too cerebral to be that buff, you know. I I gotta I can't. Well, it could be a misdirect, I guess. Be buff and cerebral. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Hello. yeah. It's just I don't want to be typecast because of how, my, how I look. But it, like it's it's so that's another thing I realized. Like in the beginning, I was thinking stuff like, well, I don't want to be doing all that heavy those hardcore lifting exercises because I yeah. wouldn't want to get too big muscles. 
Yeah. But yeah. then it's like, that doesn't happen overnight, bro. You got to work so hard for it and eat right. And, you know. There's a clip you can find on YouTube. It's from uh, way back in the, in the early 70s. I, I want to say it might even be from the 60s. It was before Arnold right. was Mr. Olympia. I want to say that. Anyway, you can find it on YouTube where Arnold is, uh, he actually was walking around outside. I think it was in Stuttgart in Germany when mm -hmm. he was living there, walking around in just his posing trunks in the middle of winter. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> trying to promote the gym where he was working at. Right. And uh, some some lady, a uh, middle-aged lady comes up to Arnold and says, uh, uh, you are disgusting. I'm so glad that my husband isn't like you. And Arnold says, in typical Arnold way, ha ha, he never will be like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's people have their opinions on, on uh, training. Yeah. People have their, their pre, pre-made conception of what it means to be uh, uh, in shape and people yeah. call it narcissistic and, and selfish and all that. But I think those are the people who are in bad shape and they're just projecting. They know oh, yeah. Yeah. that there's something good about being physically fit. People project a lot. You find that with sure. people who uh, talk about going to the gym and they feel all these stares. And it's like, no, everybody's on their own bag. They're not really that preoccupied yeah. with you. And if they see somebody who's wildly out of shape, they'll usually think something like, good on you. I hope you stick with it. You know? I think most people these days have, well, you know, look what happened um, in powerlifting, for example. Yeah. When I first started powerlifting, um, 2014, 2015, uh, there was a certain number of women mm -hmm. powerlifting here in Norway, but then all of a sudden, like overnight around 2016, all of a sudden we're starting to see more female competitors at right. certain competitions than men. Yeah. So there's there's a sea change. There's a, there's a, there's a thought process that is different now, where training and physical fitness and strength yeah. has become this universal thing. It's not just. And it's and a narcissistic media. It's so easy too. If I need to look up form or something, go find a YouTube video or a quick yeah. wiki how to or something. It's like it's so easy to get going and started. But yeah, it's uh yeah, in the beginning it was so freaking hard. And now that's I'm a now part. I'm a lifter. It's really weird. Yeah, Age yeah. thirty six I started. Yeah. You know, and that's the hardest part is getting started. But yeah. when you start seeing and feeling the results, yeah. It it's why would you not continue that? Because you feel good. You feel better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so why would it not be continued? Now I'm just hoping for it to, you know, mask my social awkwardness with the ladies. Compensate for that shit. But you have social awkwardness I'm some way off for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But you're so charming and witty and <laughs> cute. Look at this, yeah. look at this guy. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, uh, I am. It's That's fine. But once it's like, all right, let's I was let's just kidding. He's not charming, witty, or cute. <laughs> I mean that's uh, that's not even funny, bro. What are you, what are you saying? No, but I'm uh, I I would say that it's I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm charming. But uh, once it gets to a point like okay, let's try to transition this into something a bit more hot and heavy. I don't have any moves in that area. But that is such an area of uncertainty. I think for a lot of guys. Oh yeah, and if you're anxious to begin with, it's yeah. a tough one. Yeah, but it's I find it so weird that I can go on stage in front of a hundred people, risk making a Isn't fool of myself. Is that something? But one girl, and it's like. Mm. <laughs> well, that's more personal. That's more. You know, we can. No, hide, I get it. We can hide behind our performance yeah. on on uh, on stage. But that relationship thing is so real. I, I say this all the time. If yeah. I was single, you know, I've been married for twenty one years. Yeah. If I was single, I wouldn't know how to begin. <laughs> I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I don't have that kind of yeah. confidence Yeah. that Don Juan, that, uh, you know, uh, Sean Connery or Denzel Washington smoothness. So how'd you bag yours? Or did she grab a bagging? She's a simple home? country girl. Okay, simple country. Anything she would have met at that point was a step up. No. Um, how, how did we, we had a lot in common, Snoopy mm. and I, that's what it was. Um, we were both into health and fitness, uh, uh, we were pretty much in lockstep when it comes to our views on life issues and stuff. So it was just one of those um, fairy tale matches made in heaven. Yeah. It sounds corny, but that's really what it was. We just fell into lockstep as soon as we, well, I don't want to say as soon as we met because the first <clears throat> time I met her, I was, I was still married. So it was like, oh, yeah, hi, nice to meet you. Was Someone, she the other woman? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Uh, so the first time I was like, yeah, hi, to, hi, nice to meet you. Goodbye. And that was it. Yeah. The next time, Everything just clicked. Everything just fell into place. So that happens. But I think for most men, yeah. the whole dating thing, I don't care how tough or how cool they act, I think in their heart and mind, they're extremely uncertain of themselves. Yeah, sure. But they go and do it. I can't do it. I find it so freaking hard. <sighs> but uh, you know what? I'm putting that to one side. I'm working on a lot of things in my life. And Maybe a you girl's need a wingman. You need a wingman. I probably do need a wingman, yeah. 
Get Anthony out there. He doesn't know. Again. No. Last time yeah. he tried to wing me was horrible. <laughs> oh gosh, Anthony, what's wrong with you? I was in I was in Bergen. I did this. Uh, sorry, Anthony, if you're listening, but I, I gotta <laughs> throw this out he, there. He's not listening. No, he's not listening. <laughs> uh, I, I, I we went to Bergen. We did stand up there, right? And I we were at this club, and it's a place called Ulebul, proper nice venue. It was a low, you know, it's like a low basement, club basement with 100 people in it. And it's like, it perfect for stand-up. And I went on stage and it was like a one long victory lap. It was so much fun. <laughs> I enjoyed myself so much and I felt like the shit after I left. Yeah. And then we go to a, a, a club. Uh, is, uh, Eleo, uh, who I uh, introduced you to. Eleo Sofia, um, trans comedian. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she. She. Uh, she. Was. She was like, "Let's go to the club," and I'm like, eh, dude, "Yeah, all right, I guess." She and Anthony were up for it, and this chick started hitting on Anthony. Okay. Anthony wasn't interested. He decides, and I know this is, you know, this is not a good wingman experience, but he he basically was like, "No, nah, no," but my friend here, my, you know, and she he pointed me over to me, and she just craned her neck and looked at me, and then she did a little. Oh, ouch. And I'm like, I didn't even ask. That hurts my soul. <laughs> yeah, right? Just another day. Just another, Just day another in weekend in my life. Yeah, no. So I, I went home after that and I was like, fuck that noise. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, dating, screw that. I'm going to work on myself for now. <laughs> Is there something to that whole thing? If one works on oneself and you reach a certain level of success, that brings about a certain level of confidence, which changes your vibe. And all of a sudden, yeah, I'm sure. dating and all that stuff becomes easier. Sure. It's a couple of decades to overturn in my case, though. <laughs> a couple of decades. A lot of habits that are ingrained that make me a bit funny, but they're not conducive to good dating. I think the whole relationship thing out there, again, I've been married for 21 years, so I'm kind of out of the loop. But from what I see, it seems to be extremely difficult, especially for men. Uh, I don't want to say the U2, uh, the U2, the, the Me Too uh, movement got out of hand, yeah. but I will say that the Me Too um, process affected the confidence of a lot of men because it seems like there were certain cases, uh, these Me Too cases that were being brought forward where I was really left scratching my head and wondering, okay, but what was wrong? It seems like it was just that dating thing. Yeah. And the woman wasn't into it, so that was that. Yeah. But it gets it gets turned into some form of male aggression. So I think if you're a decent guy, those kind of stories worry you a little bit, yeah, I yeah. assume. And I think that maybe that affects the way guys put themselves out there in the dating world. I was thinking like that before me too. Really? Like yeah. who needs another obnoxious guy with an angle coming over to you? Like every if I were to just start a conversation with a random girl, I'd be like Okay, she she knows that this guy's looking for something yeah, in these the same angle, lines. Yeah, but don't you have to have an angle? To no, start I'm sure. Yeah, but I'm I I just I just get the sense that women are so sick of all that you know dudes constantly. Nah. So I'm I'm like okay, let's not be that guy. But if you're not that guy, you're not going to be any guy on their radar. I was just going to say that if you're but not it, that guy, you're yeah. you're you're single. No, I know. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm respectful. <laughs> but I was going to say, I feel like it's the same as stand-up, right? In that you got to, if you if you want to find out where the line is and how to play that perfectly, you got to screw up and cross it sometimes. You do. Um, I, uh, now, I'm not talking about any, you know, handsy stuff or anything like that, but just, you know, an awkward come on uh, that doesn't work out, right? You got to be able to risk that and not feel too bad about it like you're being an asshole. But uh, I, I would be terrified out there. Yeah. If I was a single guy these days, I'd be terrified. Yeah. I should have held on to my wife. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, sometimes I forget you were married before. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Six years. Whoop. They was say rough. if you make it past seven years, make it pass as if this is huh? some torturous journey. <laughs> no, but if you if you last seven years, they say you're more you're you're much more likely to hold out and keep that marriage till death do you part. I don't know what it is about that seven year mark. All right, I'm glad we didn't make it to that one. Yeah. I, that was the first relationship where I felt happy that it ended. And that's really? not. A, that's really? not. A, yeah. So you weren't heartbroken. Uh, well, it was tough, of course. But uh, but I felt like this was needs, there embarrassment. This needed to happen. Uh, that no stigma of being the guy who couldn't make it work. No. No. I don't really care. Uh, when I when I and, yeah. and my first wife divorced, it was like, oh, yeah, okay, breathe. Another part of the statistic. Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, and I I just thought, okay, that part of my life is is over now. Yeah. Now I can evaluate it and put it to put that evaluation to good use yeah. and move forward. Yeah. 
No, with us, it was so many things working against us. It was, I, I'm not even going to go into it. It would need its own episode, uh, <laughs> as any broken marriage yeah. would, right? But, uh, yeah. but, uh, well, you know, we don't want to talk, we don't want to say anything bad about that. No, no, no. I want to, I want to stress that I, I, we're still friends. Uh, I and learned, that's good. I learned you told me that so much from her. Yeah. Uh, very Is important person to my life. Uh, no, younger, two years okay. younger than me. To be able to break up a marriage and still remain friends is quite the task. That doesn't always happen. Yeah, well. Didn't happen with me. We're special people. <laughs> well, I do see more of that friendship after divorce thing here in Norway than I did back yeah, home. Yeah. It seems to be a different way of looking at the whole aspect, that whole aspect of life called relationship yeah. and marriage. You guys here in Norway seem to be able to work that friendship out after the split. There's also less ego invested in things, I think. In the U.S., there's a different culture. You take stuff as slights more easily and stuff. My ex-wife is from Los Angeles, and I could tell from her, okay. like, she had a different sort of, she felt disrespected way more easily than a Norwegian would. And, uh, yeah, there's probably a bit more ego tied up into things, I think. That's probably part of it, but I think a lot of it also is that men get butchered in divorces right. in the States. Right. So that brings about a lot of bit of bitterness. Never did a layup in her life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but 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 that is something that needs to be fixed. You know, there, yeah. again, I don't want to rehash my thing, but there, yeah. it, it wasn't fair. It wasn't legally fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, neither financially fair nor fair when it came to, to uh, uh, custody and visitation with my son. Right. So maybe that's part of the bitterness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no it's uh it's uh it's complicated and uh, yeah. I uh I'm not stressing to get back into a marriage. They don't, we really both of us weren't really into marriage to begin with. It's not as if we were like, well you got to get married and everything. Like we we Why'd just you do it then? We did it because it was the only way for us to be together. Ah, of course. Yeah. She's from Los Angeles. And yeah, yeah. And the whole thing with the visa <clears throat> and all that. To, yeah. And, uh, you know, finding a career over there is really hard. And uh, so she, we were like, try your chances in Norway and we can see if this thing works out. And uh, she's still here. She's uh, she's in Tunspot again. And she's in, yeah. she's glad that she jumped ship from the U.S. So, uh, Is she remarried? No. I don't know what's happened in the past six months, but okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. She's not remarried. As far as I know, she's not dating anybody, but I wouldn't necessarily know. I'm trying to think how that would be. I don't want to jinx myself, but I'm trying to think how that would be being an American in Norway, yeah. but single. Yeah. Americans are pretty cool. They got still got a lot of social clout just from TV. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. And yeah. you can and you can you can throw out stuff like you're the powerlifting champion of Norway. Like you, I could do that. <laughs> well, no, because then going back on that stigma of being the the ultra fit, uh, super strength guy, a lot of people are going to assume I'm a meathead. Yeah, sure. So I could. I'm just saying. That. I'm just saying. You got angles, bro. <laughs> I'm black. Yeah. It's a fetish thing for some you, You'd have to get out of this marriage first, though, without her taking the knife to you. <laughs> she will knife me. She will cut me. Oh, my gosh. She, no, I uh, I don't know how to say it without it sounding corny, but Snoopy is my best friend. Yeah, yeah. She is the pillar of strength that keeps everything in my life steady. I don't think that's corny at all. I, I find it so weird that there seems to be this big part, uh, amount of guys who are like... They they don't like hanging with their wife or a significant other like that's I do that with the boys I can't talk to her about other stuff and it's like man to why'd each, you marry her to each his own <laughs> but, but but I couldn't see it any other way no, Snoopy, Snoopy is my best friend yeah I tell I tell the boys no all the time yeah. because I would rather just sit uh, on the couch and watch a yeah. movie and eat ice cream with Snoopy yeah, yeah. you know um, I would I I couldn't imagine it being any other way how could you live with have sex with, share financial situations with somebody that you don't really consider a good friend. Yeah. But you're right. A lot of men, yeah, they just they, they push that friendship. They're in a different category. Yeah, wife. they're not a good hang. They're just my wife or significant other. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> well, Snoopy's a good hang. She. Uh... Yeah, no, that's one of the things I miss about my ex-wife. She was she's a huge nerd. And uh, yeah. and so much fun. Yeah, she dragged me to do pen and paper, uh, dun uh, like Dun and da uh, Dungeons and Dragons role playing game really? for the first yeah. time. Yeah, some friends of mine. They've been trying to coax me for years. And I told <laughs> her about it, and she's like, "Oh, we're doing that." But see, there's that friendship element. Yeah, that sense of adventure where you jump into something new together and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. Um, I bet a lot of marriages aren't doing that. These marriages where yeah. there's no friendship, or the marriages that end. Yeah, I bet you they're not jumping into th adventurous things together as friends. Yeah. 
I think it could probably work if you're not the introspective type, and if you don't, you know, if you got, if you, if you just I love that word introspection. Yeah, if you I've just been using that a lot. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's my mode. But uh, I, yeah, I think if you, if you, if you're just like let's let's just do the life things and and they don't look too deep and stuff, then you can probably get by with that. But if you're if you're an introspective type, then and it probably has to align a lot more. Well, the thing is, you 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 use the phrase "get by." I think a lot of people, it, yeah. marriage becomes this monotonous thing, yeah. and they're just getting by, and it's for like, the yeah, kids this or is, for the yeah, yeah mortgage they, or, or, or for the, for appearances because yeah, a lot of people yeah. get embarrassed if they go through a divorce. It's right. embarrassing to people. Um, what what a sad situation when there's no friendship element. That's such a binding force. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I I don't know. I don't want to say, hey, everybody, look at me and and live your life this way. But for me, I couldn't picture myself having a good marriage with Snoopy if we weren't also friends. Yeah. You know, with the inside jokes and we laugh about things and we go and do things yeah. together. We can sit and talk. Uh, out there on the porch for for two hours, yeah, and enjoy it. Yeah, sometimes not even speaking at all, but just sitting there together. Yeah, yeah. I sound like a couple of old uh, fogies or something. That's how you want to sound, bro. <laughs> no, don't 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 go testing single life. It's it's not. No, yeah. I I don't I I don't know how people do it. I really <laughs> don't. Yeah. I get, I see how women do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think sure. it's I think it's a lot easier for of course women have um and There's I don't want to get risks. in trouble here. Yeah. Women do have risks because yeah, uh I, I like Louis C.K.'s joke on it, which is very ironic <laughs> considering the trouble he got into. But he was talking about how he can't understand how women trust any guy. Here's yeah. somebody who's twice as big as you, yeah. three times as strong as you, yeah. and is uh very often ruled by their penis and by uh aggressive hormones. But yeah. you're gonna go out with this guy. Yeah. That's no, a scary situation. It is, yeah. I can understand. I can understand why you know women are by default skeptical. And I used to give myself such a hard time because walking down the street, girls or women will often just completely avoid your uh, gaze. Right? They'll they'll look the other way. I would take that as a as if it meant like, oh goddamn, that guy's ugly and you know whatever. But now I just know it's like, well, you don't want to encourage random dudes all the time right so well, you yeah, learn how yeah. to just put the resting bitch yeah. face on and and it makes perfect sense but i used to take it personally because i you know i'm a depressed guy and well, well but, it, <laughs> but I, I can get that yeah. i understand that women are cautious but uh you know because there are a lot of idiots out there there's yeah. a lot of guys out there who ruin it for the good guys yeah uh but i think wrapped up in all of that there is also this thing that sh that tells me that women do have it easier on the dating scene because if nothing's going to happen, if the woman doesn't want anything to happen, it's not going to happen. But if she wants it to happen, yeah. we're weak and it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we are weak. You know, I think that, <laughs> well, let me ask you, who do you think uh, accepts a substandard partner more often, men or women? Uh, men. Yeah. 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 Because... That'll do. The, because a lot of men will fall into that thing, well, at least yeah. I'm getting laid. I'm getting sex. Yeah, there's there's plenty of guys who go like, it's 3 a.m., last shot, let's just exactly. throw out, do you want to fuck exactly. at people in the taxi queue? We're guys, and we know that. That's how yeah. a lot of guys think. I don't do that, but, no, uh, yeah, but a I've lot heard of guys it, do yeah. think that way, yeah. you know? Play the percentages. Um, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whereas I think women have this, I don't know, ability, power, or maybe it's just the way it is, <laughs> to where they choose what they truly want. Yeah, that's well, what they go with. It's like, uh, am I wrong? No, no. It's like it's like the bird world, right? The bird, uh, the male bird, has to put on a show. <laughs> they got the makeup there, so yeah. it's kind of the opposite. But like, <laughs> they have to put on a big show, and the woman can sit back and wait. And it's kind of like that. Obviously, there's going to be women who fall into the, you know, the other category where like they're having a hard time to, they can't give it away for if, free or whatever. You know, there's there's probably those out there too. But it's uh, by and large, you're right. By I think and men large, have yeah, a hard, I think, I think yeah. if you're if you're a good guy and you have good intentions, you mean well, yeah. and you just are looking for a good partner uh short-term long-term basis it doesn't matter yeah. if you're looking for that i think you are going to struggle a lot more than a woman in the same situation yeah. a woman who's a good person who has good intentions and just wants a good man i think she's going to find that good man a lot quicker than we're going to find that good woman because there's something in and i guess i'm speaking mostly of the western world mostly because this is where we live and yeah what we grew up with yeah. but on the, on the west in the western world Men, I believe, are they have less. Um, I don't want to say they have less decision making, 
Well, maybe, but maybe they do. Again, I think women can choose mm. more often that good partner more often than men than men can. Men will settle for. Norway's a, there's also this trend of um, uh, women preferring men who've already had kids to have kids with. They'll go for yes. a, somebody with a track record. Yes. Which is so there's and a, men won't do that. So there's a growing percentage of dudes who just yeah. uh, like a third or whatever who don't get to take part in that at all. Mm. I, I don't, you know, I don't want kids, so that doesn't hit me hard, but it's, it's, it's indicative of, uh, yeah, the closer you get to uh, full self-actualization, I think, the, the, the more women can be like, all right, I don't need that. I can pay my own way. I can wait. I can hang with the girls until yeah. the right guy yeah. comes along. Yeah. But I, I, was, I just want to moderate what I just, men have it harder, I said, just in terms of finding a warm <laughs> body to be with. I'm not talking about life in general, okay? <laughs> well, you know, there's that Jordan Peterson crowd who uh -oh. will quote yeah, uh, sure. his many lines. Higher suicide he, rates, they get some Higher suicide war. rates, the most dangerous jobs are more often killed on jobs. Yeah. They're the ones who are going to die in war, uh, more likely to die of heart attacks, more likely to uh, fall with cancer. Um, what is that all about? You know, if we're, And then it makes me think, well, well, gosh, if men are that weak, why don't women just uh, go for the coup attempt and <laughs> and take over? <laughs> I say that in a joking way because we have to admit that men are uh, the rulers of all corporate things, the rulers of uh, of politics. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson wouldn't agree. There's no patriarchy, apparently. Yeah, you know, I Jordan Peterson is a smart guy. Yeah, but very conservative. He's very conservative, and that doesn't make him a bad guy. No, I, no, no. Know, that's not, that's not a problem, but. I think he's incredibly callous. Yeah, sure. You know, he'll bring up the facts, and I want to reiterate, reiterate that these are facts where men die more often from this, that, and the other, which shows that men do have it harder than women. Yeah. But he'll say that in such a callous, flippant way to prove some other point mm -hmm. that is not based in fact. He's right. using facts oh, yeah, yeah. to support his unfactual arguments. Yeah. And that's why I can't get behind what that guy says. I wish he was more sincere. I get the feeling that he says the things he says just to be that guy. Yeah, he's found he's found a payday in, uh, yeah, basically. And more power uh, to him. He's smart and he's making oh, he, it work. But he is. I, I think he loses a lot of credibility, for me anyway. I think one of the pitfalls of being smart, though, is you can very easily find arguments to support your views. <laughs> like, it's so easy if you're smart. Uh, yeah, but the, 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 the audience has to be smart, too, and be able to read through the bullshit. That's the problem. Not if you, think, not if you want to sell. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. If you want a balanced world, yeah. But uh, if you want to do well like Jordan has, then you just need to find, and he's found uh, frustrated young men. Some of whom yeah. desperately need to hear what he has to say about. Well, that's the thing. They're so desperate. They don't yeah. know how to pick deep to dig deeper underneath what he's saying. Again, he's using facts yeah. to support an unfactual yeah, argument. Yeah. No, that's that's when he gets into philosophy and stuff. But when he's talking about just getting your life together and stuff like that, he's I'm sure he's been super valuable to a ton of young men. Sure. And women. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, once he starts yeah, validating his worldview and stuff like yeah. that, that's when I go, oh my God. Yeah. I didn't think Canadians could have that line of thought. <laughs> Canadians are always so so calm and 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 liberal and kind. And he's calm except for when he's blubbing about Ayn Rand. <laughs> oh gosh, he, hate, he hates her. <laughs> no, no, he loves Ayn Rand. He starts crying quoting her. Well, Ayn Rand, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. conservative that poster, poster woman. slash yeah. conservative. Uh, type no handouts thing. except for when yeah. I'm old and dying and I need help from the U.S. state. Uh, she was a huge hypocrite too. But she's a poster girl for conservatism, it seems like. Which which is, uh, what, what did I read yesterday? Um, the Republican Senate and Congress represent barely 21% of the American voting age uh, uh, oh, right. uh, constituent in, in the U.S. That's fascinating. Uh, 21%. By what measure? I think they took a look at everyone who can vote, not everyone who is voting. Yeah, yeah. But everyone who can vote and has, you know, checked checked off for Republican or Democrat. All right. So this is how many actually voted them in. Yes. Oh, right. I got you. But because of things like the Electoral <clears throat> College. Yeah. Which, that's yeah. A, that's a whole podcast. In gerrymandering. Itself. And and especially gerrymandering. Yeah. This this twenty one percent 
is basically now, for example, with Roe v. Wade, with uh, abortion law, this 21% is getting their way when actually 70 some odd percent of Americans want uh, uh, women to have the right to choose. Yeah. Yeah, and there's something that's not democratic with that. Yeah, well, it's been it's it starts out you just find those little you know wedges early on, and they just get wider and wider, and they've done a real good job of wrecking whatever little ambiguity they could find. And uh, I gotta hand it system. to them; those conservatives, they yeah. know, uh, and they have known for quite some time what they want and how to get it. They're yeah. ruthless, and that's, I think that's the problem with politics in America: the Democrats are not willing to be ruthless. I look at uh, the last couple of days, Joe Biden has come out, uh, what did he, he called Trump, the, the king, uh, the, the MAGA king. Yeah. Uh, and he's been talking about the MAGA movement uh, rather harshly, which is relatively new for Joe Biden to do. Yeah. And that right there is a testament to this unwillingness of the Democrats to play hardball. Yeah. Whereas the conservatives... It would, hardball is all they know. It wouldn't, yeah. If if Democrats would be playing hardball like they do, though, it would grind totally against their message and supposed platform of you know, understanding. And you know what I'd like to see in America in politics? I'd yeah. like to see the libertarians really solidify themselves into a uh, viable political party. Yeah. So that would bring us up to three political parties. That would be good. But then I'd also like to see that um, ultra liberal wing, that progressive wing of the Democrats. Yeah. I'd like to see them split off. And go bring go about, a bit further left. Go to actual left. Yeah. And bring about four political parties. Yeah. And then let's see what happens in America. Let's see what happens with things like, uh, you know, a women's right to choose. Let's see what happens with uh, the welfare system. Let's yeah. see what happens with. Um, uh, government spending. Yeah, yeah. Because as long as we have this two-party system in America, we're not going to see any real progress because anything that Joe Biden gets done now, yeah. if the next reversed. president is conver- conservative, it's going to be reversed. Yeah. And it's just going to be that flip-flop back and forth, and that means zero progress. Not just that. Um, I think I think the Democratic Party, to some extent, consciously give cover to... Because they're, they're, they would rather... And we saw this with Bernie. They would rather spoil him twice and give somebody an actual shot against uh, Trump. But now, do you th- don't you think Bernie is too old? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm just saying he got spoiled twice. He went, he ran twice. Well, I say that kind of uh, uh, playing the devil's advocate, but you answered very quickly that you think Bernie Sanders is too old. Yeah. He's old, but he, is he too old? What's too old? Well, I mean, if... Because if, regardless of Bernie's age, yeah. isn't he speaking a lot of those progressive truths? And when we think of progressives, I think of people 35 and under. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Age, I'm not yeah. saying I'm not saying too old in anything like that. I'm I'm just saying that like age wise, you probably don't want an executive who you genuinely think might you know pop their clogs during. <laughs> the, pop their what? Their clogs. Pop their clogs. I'm gonna use that one. Yeah, you haven't heard that one. Never heard that, man. <laughs> I'm full of them. I don't uh, get out much though. I have no friends. I don't, <laughs> nor did I. I got these hip. on TV. <laughs> I'm not hip to the new jive. Okay? The jive. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> uh, no, I was gonna say though. He, I mean. I'm just saying, like, if he's if he's primering Biden, then obviously, no, he's not too old. <laughs> he's is just, do we want a progressive white old guy or you know, yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't want somebody that old in office if I were voting to, uh, ideally. <laughs> I, I guess I would look at I would look at Bernie, and and I would think, yeah, he's old. Yeah. But he is speaking the language of a lot of young progressives. Oh yeah, absolutely. If if Bernie were to run, maybe. I Maybe I would vote for Bernie. But it was very clear. The Democrats would rather see Republicans win. They made it very clear. Yeah. 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 And uh, and uh, the amount of stuff the DNC did for um, the behest of Clinton and stuff like that, was it was clearly corrupt, and they didn't even hide it. Like, Debbie Wasserman Schultz had to step down in disgrace during that 2015 uh, or 16 bad. thing. And within 48 hours, she'd been made a part of the Clinton campaign. Yeah. She just stepped yeah. down in disgrace for helping you guys, yeah. and you unashamedly bring her aboard. You don't care. That was a jaw dropper right there. Yeah. I couldn't believe the brazenness of that. Right. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a crazy move. Yeah. And that was a move that a lot of people remembered when it came time to vote. Yeah, but so, uh, that's how out of touch, uh, you know, people are. You know, they don't get how this plays for a lot of people. And I think one thing a lot of people forget in the U.S., they go like half voted for this, half voted for that. No, 
one quarter voted for this, one quarter voted for that. Half of the people stayed at home. Yeah, they don't have faith in the system. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the big one for me. Like most of the votes went to no confidence, essentially, in that sense. I and and I think that that splitting up of the parties, you know, adding a libertarian party, adding a progressive party, so we have four parties. Yeah, I think that would bring a lot more people out to vote because you yeah. have libertarian types who just don't vote because nobody's speaking their language. And you, you don't have, have to make two big tents collapse on one opinion on, you know, this and that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. John for president. <laughs> I'd vote for you. Uh, yeah, it's it's it would be interesting to see how the US would be if it were a bit more parliamentarian and like okay, you got to you got to actually represent everybody instead of this winner takes all left versus right. Yeah. Chomsky talks about this uh, in his political musings that you know, the US starts early with the uh, pep rallies and stuff like that, mm. rooting for the home team. It's very ingrained, the yeah. identity thing. And, yeah, you see it now, Democrats and Republicans. I know this guy who's a very – he's a comedian, very smart guy, studies law, very progressive dude. Used to be yeah. a police officer and now is studying law, trying to help people in the Innocence Project to get you oh. know, non-guilty people off yeah. the, the books. doing some good work, important work. He's doing important work, and he's a great guy, and I, I, I love him to death. He's a hardcore Trump fan. And a Republican, and I ask him like, "What is it? What is it about you know the Democratic platform that you you know find so heinous? You know?" And he's like, "Everything. There's nothing I agree with him on." And I'm like, "Nothing." Like he just reflexively said that. And I start talking to him about climate change, and he's like, "Well, he you know he agrees that climate change is an issue and this and that." And I'm like, "Well, well then." <laughs> yeah, but he's reflexively conditioned to sort of every time is like, "No, Democrats bad." Republicans yeah. all right. So then if he's against everything the Democrats stand for by his own words, is the converse true? Is he then for everything that Trump and the Republicans stand for? Yeah, no, he wouldn't. And, exactly. Yeah. But but people are getting shoved into these yeah. th this this either or, this us and them, this yeah. very defined thing. I am a Democrat and I believe everything, or I am a Republican and I believe everything. It's funny, you'll find you'll find true leftists uh, in the US criticizing the Democrats hard. Yeah. And then they get picked on like they're Republicans. And it's like, mm, that's not, no, I'm the left of you guys. Uh, and it's like being the child of a divorce. It's like both mommy and daddy are angry at you for not taking their side. And if you, if you believe, <laughs> if you believe in what, if you believe in the essence of the Democratic Party, I think that it is a healthy thing to voice your opposition to, again, you, you believe in the essence of the Democrats. Yeah. But there's certain elements within that essence that you feel are lacking or uh, uh, mi uh, misrepresented by the Democrats themselves. So then you criticize. And I think that should be welcome. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, people will automatically throw. For example, Joe Rogan mm -hmm. uh, says often that he is much more pro progressive in his thinking, much more liberal. And yet because he dares to criticize, you know, to mm -hmm. bring up how Bernie Sanders got screwed by the DNC and things like that, people label him yeah. a right winger, you know, because he he will have someone like Jordan Peterson come on and speak on his show. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he says he Joe says he's more of a liberal thinking person, and based on the things that he says, he is more liberal thinking. Yeah, but because he'll talk to Jordan Peterson, he gets labeled, at the very least, not a Democrat, not a liberal. That and Joe Rogan's not the sharpest mind. Like, he, what his opinion is depends on who he last talked to. Often, well, <laughs> I've I don't seen wanna, him flip I don't want to defend him, but I want to. I want to ask a question. Does yeah. it? Do, does it really? Does his opinion really waffle back and forth, or is he a good conversationalist and he's talking and having that discussion? Then and there, it could be that. But if so, he comes across disingenuous to me because he's he's clearly like being inconsistent and just because he and i i imagine it is part of that he wants to have a good show he wants to try to understand the other person's viewpoint and it's val mm -hmm. it's valuable but i wouldn't take any cues from joe rogan because he's not true north in any way <laughs> that's true yeah. that is true but well, you know for example you and i five ten minutes ago we're talking about women and, and me too and dating and what's difficult what's easy who's that got could the power be picked so, apart yeah. people could latch on to a couple sentences and then call us misogynists i was very careful Based to qualify on, that and have it harder thing but 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 again <laughs> yeah, I, know just, mean, I know you we're, we're having a conversation and yeah. through that conversation yeah you're, you know you're touching on what you believe in yeah. but you also dip a toe into the other side yeah to get feedback or to stimulate the conversation and i don't think there's anything disingenuous about that but i think people because of social media have forgotten the art of conversation and dialogue Excuse me, dialogue. They've forgotten what that is. Sure. They'll latch onto that one thing in the discussion, yeah. and then they'll define the entire dialogue by that one sentence. But, like, 
I smoke way too much meat, weed to give you any good citations on this, but uh, uh, I know for I know for a fact that Joe Rogan is is quite inconsistent with himself at times. Like he'll 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 talk a good game about something, and then he'll get somebody for the other side on, and he'll genuinely seem, and then he'll flip for a while. Like there's yeah. there's a period where there's a period where he's like completely. You know, he was anti-vax for a while there. Yeah. And then that flipped away. Like, he's, he Wildly flips a lot. Yeah. And then he, well, but let me ask you this then. Why is he so doggone popular? Why do people flock to someone who is so disingenuous? Uh, we live in the post-factual world. <laughs> it makes of, perfect sense to me. Because of social media. Facts don't really matter. How people feel matters. Uh, the Republicans figured that out ages ago. If the Democrats Again, did. they're playing hardball. Yeah. yeah. That and they know that how people feel and whether it validates how they feel about things, that's way more important than whether it tracks logically. If you can construct something that makes sense to how you feel, I'll go with that any day of the week except for the yeah, see, other than the I like to feel good, but I believe in logic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even I'm guilty of that, right? I'll, I'll, well, we all are to yeah. a certain extent, you know, because it's hard to it's, – it, it's a difficult thing to have that finger pointed at you yeah. that says – you were wrong. Oh, yeah. Admit it. Yeah. That's a hard finger to face down. Yeah. You were wrong. Admit it. So we kind of yeah. wallow in our inconsistency then. I work with- uh, It's protection. It's self-preservation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a, my, my self-esteem is pretty damn low. Like I'm working on it and working out and stand-ups helping me and stuff, but it's still pretty damn low. And, oh man, I had a point. Why did I start talking about this? <laughs> uh, but, but, uh. Where were we? I talk too much because now I don't even remember. <laughs> All right. No, we were talking about um, inconsistencies, waffling back and forth, uh, being disingenuous. And then I asked the question, why then? Oh, right, 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 Joe right, right. so disingenuous. Why do people still flock to him? Insecurity and how we get defensive and stuff and don't want to admit something because, it, you know, it makes us feel or seem weak or whatever, right? It's yeah. uh, I, I try, I work with first graders. I try as often as I can, I try to show them, yes, an adult can be wrong and he can admit it Yeah, and he can learn and move on. And, you know, yeah. I, I try to make those teachable moments anytime I get a chance to go like, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And yeah. you can show that you yeah. can own it and not be yeah. dick about it. Um, it's a lost art. <laughs> it is. A lot of people are just not willing to do that thing, that, uh, that thing called apologize. Were we ever that good at it? I think so. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. I think so. I think that before social media and before Trump, we were a lot better at it. Donald Trump showed a lot of people that it's okay to be an asshole. You think that translates lot, even here, though? Like, uh, I think so. Really? I think so. He showed a lot of people that it's okay to be a jackass. That you should. There's there's enormous benefits to never admitting that you're wrong. But there's such a tiny percentage of people in Norway who find Trump to be, you know, they're usually like wild weirdos and Democrat and stuff like that. The odd <laughs> FRP -er. But you won't find anybody yeah, else. But I think there's a lot of them out there. Sure. But uh, I'm talking significant percentages, though. We're talking 5%. I, I want to go higher than that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I'm sorry, Norway. I have no faith in you. I'm not sure I buy that. Considering where we are politically, everybody, even people on the conservative party, Hugra, they'll talk about how, you know, man, this guy. Like, uh, and that's, that's, uh, I mean, it's not super, super duper conservative, but it's the conservative party. It is a conservative it. party in yeah. Norway. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, but let's say, let's say it's 10% then one tenth. Uh, I still don't think that's enough to, and maybe I don't, not, maybe I, not. Yeah. But maybe I, this is my American mind projecting that phenomenon onto Norway. But if, if you were to, I widen, think it's definitely the case in the United States though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And if you widen, I think if you widen it, if you go like the general culture, right? Let's, yeah. It doesn't have to just be Trump. It can be the Kardashians or whatever, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Apologizing is not cool. You want to be assertive. You want to be, meh, you know, uh, you want to be a, somebody with a grind set <laughs> who's, uh, who's yeah. always moving forward. Yeah. Always like a shark, never still. You know, it, like we we got all these weird things we fetishize these days that probably aren't conducive to reflection and sincerity. Reflection and sincerity, that is uh, something we definitely need more of. Um, but I don't know. Again, I don't. I think there's a there's a big handful of people out there that aren't willing to do that. They have their way of viewing things. They have their way of living, and they just keep on marching, and uh, damn the consequences. I think that's always been the case that people don't think that much. I think people do. Really, you people, think so? People do. Yeah, I, for the most part. Yeah. I don't know. That's why, like, 
you can see it in just small things. Like I, 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 I me and my my ex wife, we don't want kids. We, right, right. And, and uh, people call that childless. Uh, yeah. We say child free. Like yeah. it's it's nice to show yeah. that it doesn't mean we're lacking something. And that's and, an important distinction. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, some people are childless, but we were child free. And uh, the attitudes you get from people and stuff, yeah. like, uh, you know, that's selfish. Or what if your mother said that? Or, you know, you're getting bingoed is what they call it. In the, in the you know, like you had a bingo card of stock phrases you're always going to come across. And, and, and these are things people don't even think about, but they right. automatically go like, oh, you're attacking my values. Yeah. There's yeah. a number of those things, I think, which are just received wisdom that we never questioned. Right. And we just move on. Uh, we need to think more. We just need to think more. Um, I need to think less, but y'all need to think more. <laughs> <laughs> There's medication for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Uh, th that's a part of what I've been figuring out this past year, whether I should be doing that. But my therapist decided that I'm, I'm, I'm digging myself out of the hole without any. <laughs> Antidepressants are scary, man. Antidepressants are very scary. For, and for some people, they're necessary. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Some people can find their comfort or their healing in, um, in marijuana. Yeah. Uh, I'm a firm believer in, in, in legalizing mar mar marijuana, both for the sake of legalizing it and also for its medicinal, uh, I don't smoke myself. I sure. never have, sure. but it's undeniable that there is a medical benefit mm. To marijuana, and I think it's a shame that it is not. You know, we, we use opiates, yeah, sure. ha basically Easy. heroin, synthetic heroin. We, we do that, and there's not a problem. Yeah. Why can't they look at marijuana in the same way? In the U.S., there's also stats that since they uh, legalized, there's been few, uh, uh, lowering of the rates of people getting addicted to opiates and stuff. Uh, uh, I believe there's very solid documentation on that, both in the United States, uh, but also in uh, Portugal. No doubt, yeah. When they uh, outlaw, um, I'm sorry, took away. Uh, Decriminalized everything. Yeah. Thank you. That's the word. Decriminalized. <laughs> the Norwegian teaching me how to speak English. <laughs> Words are um, my jam. But when they set that in in, uh, in place in yeah. Portugal, addiction way down, death by overdose way down. Any metric you care to mention that's yeah. significant, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, Norway's funny, actually, because medical marijuana is not legal here. You can, however, treat your depression with ketamine. That's that's a hardcore party drug. Well, no, I don't know about hardcore, but it's it's a psychedelic it's party there, drug. And yeah. It's some powerful stuff. It's powerful, yeah. Uh, they, I've had ketamine a lot for these operations. I really? Think. Oh yeah. Did it have psychoactive effects? Um. Or was it just uh, pain relieving? We try to think how to uh, describe. Well, it wasn't. It was uh, something that they would give me uh, before uh, the operation, and then for a period afterwards. And, you know, and I don't want to talk people into financing ketamine to abuse it, but you feel great. Sure. Yeah. Um, when they stick it into the IV, you just feel it as mm. soon as it hits your body. Um, uh, that, that tingling that, you know, you might, you might get goosebumps if you, yeah, yeah you're in a, you're, you're feeling happy or whatever. Imagine feeling that multiplied by a hundred all throughout your body and your mind into your very depths of your soul you feel that next time that i'm doing that i need an iv apparently <laughs> so 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 kidding. if you can imagine then yeah oh yeah uh decreasing the dosage you know just to have that micro effect on your psyche if you're yeah. depressed or, or if you have anxiety i can see why ketamine is used for that and that is a good purpose for it mm. you know to put your mind in balance um why can't they do the same process with marijuana Mm. decriminalize it, take the criminal element out of it, tax it so that it becomes an income for the people yeah. and then put it to good use. It's so funny in Norway, the, there's a big argument now because of the uh, Rus reform, the reforming of the drug laws, yeah. which I tried yeah. to push through last year. It's so weird to me that the left, the labor party were the ones torpedoing. Whereas the conservatives were trying to sort of get us into the 21st century on this. And People will say stuff like, you you guys are all for just freeing drugs into society. And it's yeah. like, no, that's what's happening now. We want to regulate that shit exactly. so kids can't buy it. Exactly. And so there's opening and closing times. So there's quality assurance. So there's responsibility. Right. But they want it to be free and increased like it has been doing since the, you know, the war on drugs. Well, that's the corruption anything. of money. That's the corruption uh, that all things financial. I, I, I think it's also moral panic. 
There's a lot of support in Norway for not decriminalizing. Norway. Yeah, there's a strong moral panic in Norway. I think, to me, when people say the word narkotika, which means illegal drugs in Norwegian, uh, I think something lights up in people's brains akin to when you say rape. Yeah. It's just, oh, this word, yes. and I, you can't be soft on it, and yeah. it's like... Uh, I think I think Norway definitely needs a more broad discussion around that issue because I think it boils down to informing the people. Yeah. People are are not informed. Again, nar- narcotics, narcotica, yeah. and they just run with their thoughts on that. It's it's so funny actually because I think Norwegian trust in our government is too high in this sense. Exactly. Yeah. Because people will be like, well, they say it's illegal. It's probably for a reason. Yeah. And they'll be just be fine with it, and they don't well, question. Well, one thing when it comes to marijuana, people here in Norway are are used to uh, hash. Yeah. Or God knows what is baked into that. Sure. Yeah. To where it is not really. Spare tires cannabis, sometimes. Like, yeah, it's yeah. not really cannabis anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, there needs to be an information campaign. Yeah. Uh, you know, those people who are for the legalizing of it uh, need to start working together and, and start talking about it. And show so people, people the, get informed. Yeah, show people the flowers, not the bricks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the flowers, not the bricks. <laughs> Now, I think Norway's going to move along, but it's like the rest of the world's going to have to do it, and then we're going to have to catch up. Norway's never, yeah. very rarely we lead the way, uh, I feel like, anymore. Norway is a slow-moving country when <laughs> yeah. it comes to political reform. Very yeah. slow-moving. Um, kind of slow-moving socially. People have their ingrained thoughts about... Yeah. Um, well, however, I think Norway has surpassed the United States when it comes to uh, the acceptance of LGBTQ people. I Probably think Norway maybe. has surpassed America. Probably, maybe. Uh, yeah. That's my, I mean, US that's as my a, view anyway. The U.S. Yeah. as a whole, definitely. Uh, yeah. You know, if we're talking yeah. liberal bastions, then maybe not in terms of the trans thing, because I think that's probably still not that widespread in Norway. But, like, the, the U.S. is way more loud about that those issues. That's right true. Now. Maybe that's it, yeah. Yeah. But, and, but also that, yeah, it's such a weird dynamic. It also alienates people on the right because they feel like it's getting forced on them and stuff. And it's, it, I never but, understand that. Forced on them. Yeah, right. How, how does... Gay marriage, the right to gay marriage. How is that being forced on? I just never understood when conservatives say that. You don't feel like it devalues been... your marriage? <laughs> <laughs> you know, not in the slightest bit. To me, it's just another expression of love. Yeah, Those yeah, two course. people love each other. Yeah. Good for them. And I don't have to understand everything about it. No, sure. You know, uh, I can't get inside the mind of a homosexual uh, person because I'm not homosexual. So mm. I don't know exactly what they're thinking. I don't know. I don't know what it means yeah. to be oppressed or suppressed as, yeah. a, as a homosexual i don't yeah. understand that yeah however that doesn't it, and it almost seems like people feel like well if you can't understand it then you're against it right <laughs> that's how you people see, feel about dave Chappelle. well exa- exactly <laughs> i was gonna bring, i was gonna roll this into that discussion <laughs> as stand-up comedians yeah. but but you know i don't i just because i don't understand it doesn't mean i'm against it because yeah. i'm not against it yeah but there's that element out there, and here we go to the far left. We've been talking about some far right crazies, but there's the far left crazies who mm-hmm. will automatically dub you uh, oh, yeah. anti-trans or anti or homophobic yeah. or whatever just by hearing me state the fact that I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, no, back to dialogue. People don't know how to talk about things anymore. Yeah, actually, uh, there was a thing that illustrated this pretty perfectly for me a couple of years ago, I think. Liam Neeson came out. And mm. said that he knew a woman he knew got raped by somebody yes. in Dublin or whatever. This, yeah. yeah, and and uh, they turned out to be a black uh, yeah. person or something. And he'd roam the streets for the next few weeks, hoping that somebody would pick, yeah. you know, pick on him so he could fucking smash him. Hope a black person, a black ideally. Person. And he he mentioned this, and he said that he was so ashamed for it. And they took him through the ringer for it. And this is a guy who's owning up to what he was thinking. Exactly, because he was very. I mean, his at the same time as he told the story, he yeah. also, in his way, apologized by saying he was disgusted yeah. with himself for yeah. thinking that yeah. way. So he's already put himself through the ringer yeah. once. Yeah. And yet this element, this left yeah. leftist element, this liberal element, had to put him through the ringer again. And that is what I do not understand. Same thing with Louis C.K. and everything that he did. Yeah. He apologized. He even It even came out that he apologized directly to some of those victims. Mm-hmm. So that should have been the end of it. But society, this left-wing element of society, yeah. had to come in and make him suffer for that, yeah, or pay the consequences of that again. Yeah, and I, I just I. And what and what do you do when there's no road to redemption? Well, exactly. you certainly stop trying to redeem yourself. Exactly. You'll lean in. You'll find other people who accept you for exactly. you know. You'll go the other way. Yeah, it's it's messed up. It's uh, 
but I think I think I think uh, my ex-wife her <laughs> master's was in social psychology, oh. which is a scary ass field. Uh, for people who don't know, essentially came about after the Second World War. And they were trying to figure out how could the Nazis do what they did, and in the end, they found out we're all good Nazis in the right conditions. Oh. Not all of us, but like you know, that's what that what Milgram and and Stanford yeah. those prison experiments and the shocking people, and as long as the dude with the lab coat said it's fine, you can turn it up to ten, even yeah. though it's, they said it would kill somebody. Yeah. Shock them. They they did those tests, and people usually will defer to authority and do whatever. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the only people who seem to have taken the lessons from that have been corporations in trying to divide and conquer, uh, it seems like. There's not a lot of positive fruits from that. It seems like it's mainly been used to sort of split people up and make them consumers. Right. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with society? <laughs> we were made by evolution, and what works works and gets more and more worky. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's just there's so many things that I, I and I struggle to understand it. Yeah, I try to figure out why did people feel that they had to go on this campaign against Louis C.K. Why do they feel like they have to go on this campaign against Dave Chappelle? Yeah, what is you know? And, and to me, the, let's take Dave Chappelle for example. Yeah. To me, uh, well, I gotta be careful how I formulate myself. Um, you I don't want understand. tame schoons on you. There are people, for example, a comedian could make uh, a joke about black people, and let's say I don't like that joke. Yeah. Where do I get the gall to then expect everyone else to not not like that joke yeah. as well? To me, there's something wrong with that. Speak there's for black people and say this joke is. Yeah. There's a certain amount of selfishness in yeah. there, and I think that that's what people did with Dave Chappelle because. There's a lot of people who laughed at that joke. They don't insist that everybody think it's funny. So why yeah. do the people that thought it was harmful yeah. insist that everyone else should think it's harmful and you're wrong if you don't? Yeah. I, that's that's the whole part of that thing that I don't understand. People's the people's propensity for imposing their own thought process on others. Here's one of the real ironic things about the Chappelle thing because uh, you know they had the Netflix walkout and all that stuff, right? Uh, the woman who led the charge on trying to get Netflix to boycott Dave, oh. uh, she has a long Twitter history of being racist right. towards Asians I heard that, and yeah. smacking on them as bad yeah. drivers. And, 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 and yeah. she was posting so many hateful things. In his special, there's nothing as hateful as a lot of the things that she posted up. I mean, she was funny too. She's she's got some delivery on her. Ah, okay. But she yeah. should appreciate Chappelle more than. Uh, but but it, yeah, and and I, there were things I didn't agree with with him. He said stuff like, uh, "Sex is a uh, fact," or "Gender gender is a fact." I forget Gender's which one. Fact. Gender is a fact. And it's like, he sounds like he's confused about his definitions on that one. And like, there's a couple of things I was uncomfortable with. But you can always tell if with Dave, it's coming from a place of love, from a place of joking, and there's yeah. no hate anywhere there. You know. If, if someone is just putting something out there because they are in the process of trying to understand it, yeah, you can't, well, people do, but I don't <laughs> see how people can yeah. jump on that person and condemn them yeah. when they're in the process of trying to understand yeah. something. I, I got the feeling that Dave Chappelle, and, I, and he said some things that I would never dare to say myself, yeah. and he said some things that I did not disagree with, but underneath all of that, or maybe wrapped around all of that, mm -hmm. was the feeling that Dave Chappelle is in this process, he's on this journey, yeah. trying to understand that. The death of his friend, his trans friend, mm. put him in this position to where he's airing his thought process out there. Yeah. Us. How can you condemn the man when he is still on a journey? Yeah, he's still trying to figure it out. Yeah, I I I, I don't understand it. No, yeah, and I and just and, don't. and the core message of the thing was uh, the one thing that to me sums up his whole thing was when he quoted her saying to him, "I don't need you to understand me. I just need you to get that I'm having a human experience." Yes, and he's like, "Man, I, yeah, I get it. it. Takes one yeah. to know one, you know." Uh, exactly. And that's all you needed to know. He he doesn't, you know, labels and this, that, that can confuse people. We can disagree. But, you know, yeah, you're a person and I, I feel you. Yeah. And and he gave Daphne all the respect, you know, in the world. And clearly he's not a transphobe, even though he used that word about himself a bunch in that special. But obviously that's with... Uh, <laughs> with humor. It's, yeah. It was humor. Yeah. But uh, you know what? Screw it. This is the, this is the world we're in right now. It's probably going to simmer down at some point. There's going to be reactions against... It's this is how it goes. The pendulum swings. Well, well, somebody's going to do what Dave Chappelle did on a whole nother subject, and people are going to get just as 
wound yeah. up about it as they did with Dave Chappelle. Uh, you know, there's going to be another Louis C.K. out there who does a bunch of things to women and it's going to come out yep. and then we're going to have to deal with it and then decide whether that person should be forgiven and then allowed to come back and perform yeah. their craft. Do we burn their art now? Yeah, these kind of things are going to keep happening and I hope the point, I hope we get to the point where people understand that you can feel what you feel about that. You're entitled to that. Yeah. But you go wrong when you expect others to agree yeah. with you automatically. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, um, what would you call it? Like a, a mo monoculture. Like hmm. you don't want monoculture, right? It's boring. No, exactly. And also people, how would I even know what I felt about something if I never questioned it, if I never got attacked by other? Right. Yeah. Right. It's one of the things that is so valuable about education and stuff, coming across all these people yeah. and who have wildly different views. They know yeah. how to back them. They've read different stuff. And you get challenged. It's been so long. I, I miss the days when I would, every once in a while, I'd come across something that just shakes my foundations. Yeah, yeah. There's you no free will. What? You know? <laughs> but you know what that's called? That's called growth. And don't we all want to grow? Yeah. You why know? Why have I stopped, though? Why haven't I been shook in a while? <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't talk enough. That's the if other. you share, if yeah. you share enough of your crazy thoughts, somebody will somebody will challenge you. I'm trying, man. <laughs> Nobody's engaging. <laughs> this man needs to be engaged, people. <laughs> this guy needs a soapbox in Hyde Park and leave him alone. That's what they're thinking. Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, yeah, it's a weird ass world, man. I am. It's a very weird weird world. But uh, I I you know people talk about political correctness like it's terrible and like it's choking us, and I'm like it's way better than what it used to be. You think so? I think so. Where everything was just under, you have these assumptions about no, everything's fine. Like how many well, people you, talk about divorce rates being bad, right? But like how mm. many marriages were held, but women had no that's concept true. of even leaving. That's true. Yeah. Like there's so many things that just seemed on the surface seemed stable and fine. I think this chaos is healthier in some ways. Like in other ways, it's an expression of illness because we're in this corporate well, you know, yeah. world. Well, yeah. But well, I think it, it's a, it's at least an opportunity to incorporate some societal change. Yeah. For those who engage in yeah. introspection, for those who engage in dialogue and stuff, these these problem areas are they should be discussed, yeah. and that discussion should lead to change for the better. I think I think it would be good. The only problem is there's interests that weaponize some of these things. Like well, like yeah. Jordan, Jordan Peterson was one of them, right? Yeah. You got unrest, and the white dude is what is it they say when when. Uh, when uh, you know when you've been the you've been the person on top and everything else, everybody else has been oppressed by what you've been gaining people catching up to you starts feeling like oppression yeah and that's definitely what's going on with a lot of like Absolutely. white males around the world right now they feel Absolutely. like Absolutely. I'm supposed to be having an easier time than this and they don't get that it's just no it's leveled a bit more i mean in some ways it's gone too far the other way like i definitely feel it at times as a man you feel it right like it's every man's responsibility to stop rape and it's like man i ain't never looked a girl like that way and and I feel like I'm made complicit when I'm not, right? Exactly. And that's where yeah. the advocates for equality uh, go too far. Yeah. When they start making, almost making accusations on the people who question their methods of advocacy for yeah. the cause. And you get generational guilt that you could just get strapped with. Yes. You know? Yeah. You know, I don't believe in white guilt. A lot of white people believe in white guilt. Oh, I feel it. And, and but see, I and I wish I wish white people would stop feeling that yeah. white guilt because I think that white guilt makes them remove themselves from the conversation. Yeah, removing yourself from the conversation means that your power and privilege cannot be used to change the current situation, which you yourself, as a white person, think needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, white guilt, get rid of it and become a white ally. Yeah, sure. You know. I think white guilt is making a lot of people just remain silent and stay out of the conversation. And on the same token, when I hear a black woman telling, you know, white women or white men to shut up and right. this isn't your conversation. Yeah. I get it that they feel that way. Yeah. But again, the silencing of dialogue is not going to bring about the change. Yeah. You have, I, I, I've used this example before back in 2019, 2020, when we saw all of these uh, American citizens out marching, uh, for racial equality under the law, a majority of them were white and you saw opinions started to change. Right. So we need white people, those people in the positions of power mm -hmm. to get active for the cause. Yeah. Um, silencing them is wrong. Yeah. I think. Yeah. You can get where it comes from. It's like, we've heard enough from you guys. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but, uh, yeah. And in some ways we have, but again, that doesn't yeah. mean shut down the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and you know where does that go? If you if you shut them down and they don't get to, like that goes elsewhere and turns into resentment. Well, yeah, bitterness, like, resentment, yeah, and now yeah. all of a sudden instead of an ally, you've got yeah. an enemy. <laughs> it happens. It happens in close relationships and marriages and stuff all the time, right? Oh, like uh, one party's more headstrong, <sighs> the other one has to concede, and it, that shame and guilt and anger goes elsewhere, turns into something toxic. You know. It's, I think a lot. I think a lot of relationships they 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 have a reservoir where they place uh, that resentment. Yeah. And it just sits there, but eventually that reservoir is going to overflow, and then that's when the marriage ends. Yeah. Um, you yeah, see this I happen. You see this happen a lot, where one, like you say, one one person in the relationship is more dominant, and the one who is more submissive doesn't want to be. Yeah. So they build up a lot of resentment and bitterness, and maybe after six years, yeah, uh, <laughs> whatever, seven, ten years, even uh, that reservoir overflows. Yeah, I've got. Bitterness a, comes out and the relationship ends. I got a pension for strong women, and it's screwing me up. What's a strong woman? Somebody who has uh, strong opinions and won't shut up about them, and, <laughs> and won't uh, shut up, <laughs> and is smart. Yeah. And uh, if, but if they're that, they can be my equal, and I'm full of self doubt, so I can probably be easily, <laughs> sort of browbeaten, especially if it's somebody who's uh, got a psych degree and stuff. Like, how am I going to win well, that argument? Well, that yin and yang thing, you know, you have a weakness where. It is a strength for her and vice versa. Yeah, sure. That helps those relationships mesh mesh together. Snoopy and I have that quite a bit. Oh, yeah. No, complementing um, each other. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, it also, and it also leads to support. Yeah. You know, uh, if you have that good friendship, they know what you're weak in. They know what they're strong in. Yeah. And they're going to take their strength to build you up in your times of weakness. Yeah. Sounds corny, but that's what a good relationship is all about. No, I'm with you on that, and it's good to have somebody who's yeah got different strengths than you. Like, it's probably not good to both be completely in lockstep. That would probably be boring as well. Oh yeah, you gotta have a little fire every now and then. Yeah, yeah. You gotta spice it up. Yeah, yeah, and and <laughs> and you gotta be comfortable enough enough with each other to bring it up. So it's like, yeah, man, yeah. I think you're dead wrong on that. You yeah, know, and yeah. I, if I respect you, I'll tell you that. You know, if I don't respect you, if I'm like, ah, it's no point. This guy's not going to get it anyway. Then I'll ignore the argument. But if yeah. I respect you, I'll engage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's it like on Facebook these days? I oh yeah, I you've been know. banned. Well, there's Facebook jail. I'm in Facebook death row. <laughs> Facebook. Oh, are you? <laughs> death row. The way the way it's looking right now, I will not be able to get back on. Oh really? Neither Facebook nor Instagram. To parlor you go. <laughs> I, well, I've always had Twitter and LinkedIn, yeah. so I'm more active there now. And to be honest, I don't really miss. You're on Instagram too, huh? Yeah. Not now. Oh, okay. You're gone. That's Meta. They've um, they've booted oh, me off right. of all Meta. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's rough. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you're not you're not missing that much, to be honest. Well, yeah. you know, and and it's it's a it, yeah it's a two sided thing. I had built up. A network of several thousand people, right. which was great for the work that I do right. when it comes to promoting what I do and, and getting people on board and partnerships and stuff like that. So I miss that. Yeah. But when it comes to the disgusting conversations that can be found there, yeah, there's no withdrawal. It's okay. This is what happened. I can't be on Facebook or Instagram anymore. Okay. I'll move on to another platform. You, yeah, you got other stuff to do with your time anyway. Exactly, exactly. No, it's uh, Facebook is I to me Facebook is just a place where I can keep in touch with people, mainly for comedy. Well, I do miss that. I've lost contact with people who I only had contact with on social media. I've got um, I have friends in South Africa, for example. Yeah. I never got their phone numbers. Yeah. We would call on Messenger. Right. Or text on Messenger. And now that's gone. <laughs> yeah. I have no way of contacting those people. Yeah, that's messed up. Um, friends back home in the states never had. I never had their phone number. We would, we would communicate through messenger. Yeah, gone. Yeah, no, it's. Incredible. I feel that. I do feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Been cut off from a lot of people. Just cut off from bam. a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. But um, there's there's more fish in the sea. It's all right. When we roll out the guillotine, Zuckerberg is going to be one of the guys getting it. <laughs> well, it taught me a lesson. Um, if the platform is not yours, it can be taken away at any time, and you never know. You know, For those who don't know, somebody hacked me uh, and then posted illegal content on my, on my Facebook profile, which then led to um, uh, Facebook 
banning me. That's how bad this material was. I didn't see it myself. Yeah. But the message I got from Facebook was that that material was posted on my page and I'm banned, which I think is incredibly unfair. There's no yeah. way now if I go and log, try to log into Facebook. Yeah. I'll get a pop up that says you have been banned and this type of content. And so, There's no and way for it. you to plead your case. Absolutely no way. And I think that's pretty disgusting. Yeah. Well, it's privately owned. What can you do, right? Yeah, that's my whole thing. You can't do t too much. And the whole thing is, is when the platform is not yours, you can lose it at any time. So word to the wise, if you're out there and you're relying on, and this, I'm dead serious about this. If you're a business person relying on uh, the network that you have on any social media platform, think about diversifying that contact list. Because or, when it's gone, it's gone. Or just buy Twitter. Yeah. yeah, that's one way know. to secure it. But having said that, having said that, I've lost that platform. Yeah. Odd thing is, yeah. views and listens on my podcast oh, shit. have been up since then. See, this is this is what Peterson realized. So to the jackass, and I may be talking to the person who hacked me and did this because the timing of it, I, I don't believe in coincidence. Right. What was the timing? <laughs> it was... It was <clears throat> I, I do a lot of different things. You know that. Yeah. And I was in the, you know, the last few steps towards uh, launching uh, something new that I'm doing. Okay. And I think, you know, as you go through life, not everybody's going to like you. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of the people who don't like you, they can be people who know a lot of tech people. Yeah. Who know how to hack. Yeah. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I think I'm. I think the person who hacked me, yeah, or who had me hacked, is probably watching this episode right now. There's some people out there with some sick obsessions. Let's kill him with kindness, bro. Oh. <laughs> Listen, it's not going to help your life to screw with John Allen. Well, there's a lot of people who are jealous, or they they obsess over uh, certain elements of competition. Yeah, I'll just say that. Yeah, and I think that. Those people are out there, and I yeah. think those people had a very pointed reason for doing what they did with this hack, yeah. the posting of this illegal content. But having said that, again, the views and uh, uh, listens on my podcast yeah. are up. If you made some enemies, you're doing something right. So, what was uh, it Denzel said to Will Smith yeah. after he slapped uh, Chris Rock? He said, it's when you're on the top that the devil will come for you. Yeah. I hope he's talking about his own sort of demons and stuff because obviously that was will's own making right there yeah that that uh Did that you was see? such a disappointing thing it was yeah i was so disappointed in him same he always came across as such a good guy well-meaning he thinks out and he plans everything yeah but that was just such spontaneous foolishness yeah chris was, rock came out of it great though absolutely yeah um i think he showed enormous intelligence and control yeah to respond immediately the yeah. way he did. What I you, you you know you probably noticed this too. Having done a bit of stand up, you get a you get a sense that usually a comic, if this was a lot of people were like this was rehearsed, this was a Hollywood yeah. sort of thing, and it's like no. If you look at Chris, he would have been way more composed and had a yeah. way snappier line. Absolutely. But you could tell he was like just looking off yeah. to the side and like, yeah. are we okay? We're just carrying we're still on rolling now. Yeah. 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 He was obviously floored, and he he got out of it pretty damn good. Uh, I, it I think impressive. he did a great job. Yeah. I think he uh, showed a lot of class, a lot of yeah. self-control, and a lot of intelligence. Yeah. Uh, and if you think that whole thing was staged, well, <clears throat> keep thinking it. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, I like obviously it was a movie slap, right? He, that was a practiced movie slap with a follow-through. That did not look like a proper slap. Well, I'll also say that it didn't look proper or it didn't look harsh enough because I don't think Will truly wanted to do what he did no no i think that that woman i'm not even going to say her name yeah has put him in a position to where he feels like he needs to do her will and not will's will he's definitely very insecure and absolutely needs to, and it's it's also absolutely. i read some context about this from apparently from his biography and stuff like that uh, this goes pretty deep, but, yeah. but, um, like there's people know about the Tupac thing and that, yeah. you know, she was infatuated with Tupac and he was not thug enough for her and all right. that stuff. That's one thing. But apparently growing up, uh, Will's father was abusive to his yeah. mother and he couldn't step in yep. and he, that feeling of helplessness and being useless, carrying that with him 
for his whole life. Yep. And uh, yeah, so there's probably a lot of different things that went into all this. But but uh, I think he has been so manipulated by yeah. that woman. Yeah. I think that, uh, and, and he has some responsibility in that. Of course. Um, but I think she has some. Uh, she has a definite negative influence on him. Yeah. Um, what he did was just so uncharacteristic. Of course he did it. So now that is a part of his character, but I also believe that that character has been very much influenced by that woman. Yeah. I believe that. No. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty damn obvious. And she's way more stoic and he's a lot more, I mean, you can see, you can see, I, I didn't get this when I was younger, but, but, uh, people who seem so outgoing, vivacious and popular and like a lot of them are trying real hard because they're so damn insecure. That's the last oh, yeah. thing you'd think about Will often if you're if you're just a casual viewer and you don't think about these things. Right. But Will seems super confident. It's like no, he's he's trying not to be that little boy. Yeah. Uh yeah. No, I, and we don't know the marriage, you know. We don't we don't know anything yeah, but about we do what know the marriage because she puts it out there all the time with it. What's that called? A red table talk? Yeah, well, she that's, puts it out there. That's their curated stuff. That's why I can say, you know, I'll I'll never I'll hardly ever voice an opinion yeah. on what anybody's marriage is about. But this one, anybody can voice their opinion because yeah. she has put it all out there. Yeah. So that's why I I I, I voice my disdain. For that woman, but I don't they, even they, say your name. They put what they want out there, though. I'm sure there's context we're missing sure, and stuff. Sure, sure. But uh, but by and large, I agree with you. She seems to have Will around a, yeah. her finger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was so so disappointed. Did you see that? There's a there's a video, a, a clip from one of those red table talks where she, uh, uh, her ki their kids are sitting there, and she says that she wishes Tupac was still here. And I'm just thinking, and she said it in a way that, you know. Yeah, your father isn't good enough. You felt Where's that? Tupac? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen the clip, so I don't know. Uh... I should I should find it and link it link it into this episode. But she said a lot of things like that. Yeah, and that's fine if she has an opinion and will either accepts that or he, or he doesn't. But she voices these things in front yeah. of their children. Yeah. What if Snoopy was saying, "Oh, my ex boyfriend from 1987. Wish I wish he was around." Tupac it changes a bit though, because it's like the world lost a big artist when it came to that, and and the mystique around it and stuff. There's a lot of people who were crushed about him. Well, sure, despair. sure, but now she's married to Will Smith. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, she's watering down that marital bond when she says and does some of the things that she has said and done, and that's Will's thing, whether or not he wants to accept it. But I just question how willing he is to participate in this kind of a marriage. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, it's, I don't know. It was. Uh, again, it was. Uh, she it puts was, it out there. She puts it out there. Not me. I will say, I'm, I'm glad the slap happened for one reason, and that's that I got a couple of days. Uh, there was one day where I was like, "Holy shit! I haven't thought about Ukraine for 24 hours now." Wow. That was crazy know. to me. It took. It took. A, it took a viral slap. It's kind of. It kind of felt like the, during 2020 when the COVID first happened, and then the Suez Canal <laughs> thing happened. It's like, nice, now we get some memes and this silly thing is dominating the news for a yeah, little bit. Yeah, A little break, you know. Boy, they sure are uh, covering the Ukraine thing. I wish they would, and that's great that it's being covered the way it is in the news, but I wish they would have yeah. also covered Russia's exploits in Syria in the same way. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, the it's... World, um, the world opinion on everything happening in Syria and the Syrian refugees is not what it should be, and that's because there was very little media coverage when we yeah. compare that to what they're covering in Ukraine now. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, how, much should, how much do people know about Yemen and stuff, you know? Exactly. It's been bombed and depleted for ages. Do you know anybody who has uh, gone to Ukraine since all this has been going on? No. There's a, there's a lot of people join, joining that, uh, that foreign legion that's fighting down there. People lacking purpose. A lot of ex-military. There's a there's a lady from Finnmark who's getting a lot of media coverage. Really, uh, a Samisk woman, uh, long hair. She's always wearing her, you know, her military get up with the bulletproof vest, but with her hair down and flowing. It's almost like they're using her for shield maiden propaganda, like for a propaganda piece. Right. But apparently, she has gotten training and she's she's working in a sniper team. I saw I, one of the coolest things I saw last year was uh, no, no this year I mean it was a TikTok, uh, and it was a chick, blonde chick with a cutesy voice speaking Ukrainian, and she was like, "Okay, here's what to do if you find a Russian tank that's burnt out." 
And she goes into the tank and she's like, all right, you push this lever and this, that, and then pff, now it's going. And she's, she shows how you can turn it to the, to the use for the resistance. And, I, and I'm like, I did not know TikTok could have stuff like that on it. I'm going to show you a picture of this, this woman from Finnmark if I can find it. I can't remember her name. I'm wondering what's next on TikTok, you know, recipes for eating the rich. It's, it seems like it <laughs> might be my platform after all. But yeah, I don't, I don't know anybody who went down there or, uh, yeah, that's not, I don't, like, I, I know, I know there's a few people in that. It was interesting to see Norwegian foreign um, ministry make a statement, you know, about people's, you can go down there, but, you know, we can't help you too much if something goes bad and you got to think it through. It's, it's interesting to hear like a, a Norwegian department make a statement on if you yeah. want to become a foreign warrior, warrior in yeah. another person's war. Oh, there she is. Okay. Well, she, uh, there's a lot of people like that, but very few women. From yeah. what I understand. I think she's the only one that I've ever seen covered in the media, uh, a foreign female who has gone to Ukraine to fight, not for humanitarian stuff, but she's there to fight. Yeah. And I think that's very, that's very, uh, that's very interesting. It's very telling people's engagement with Ukraine. I have to admit, I kind of follow a lot of what's happening there because, you know, we have our other home up in Finnmark, which is right, right. next door to Russia. Right. So I, it's in my mind, you know, yeah. what if, what if. If they were to engage with us, they'd be engaging with all of NATO, though. They would, but considering does he how care? Does Putin care? Considering how engaging Ukraine went, can you imagine if they feel the full force of, they they wouldn't be able to deal with NATO. No, they wouldn't. But again, does Putin care about that? No, That's maybe not. That's the thing. Yeah, he might is just. Is he crazy enough to try something? He might be high enough on the smell of his own farts to actually try that. Because he's, he's, it seems to be the, be the case that there's such a culture that you don't want to go against Putin. He's not even getting reliable intel. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I was going to say, I think that whole thing about fearing the big Russian yeah. bear is going to change, or has changed. This is that. This is kind of similar to the thing we were talking about earlier, where people don't want to voice their opinions because yeah. it's not in. You know, yeah. it's like okay, then it's going to fester and become something else. Yeah. No, it's uh, you know, hats off to the Ukrainians. Yeah. You know, I know they're still suffering, yeah. but they're also kicking a lot of ass. Yeah. And I just hope this doesn't turn into this long, uh, 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 several year long thing. I hope. Russia gets their ass kicked to the point to where they're out of Ukraine and things are back to normal as much as possible. The whole idea of of a, of a war like that, basically right next door to us, it's it, it scares me. Yeah, I don't want my family to to be touched by war. I don't want that. No, right? You know? Yeah, it's it's insane to think about. My grandmother was eight years old when uh, the Second World War broke out. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, that's the last time Norway was really. You know, felt war on our shores yeah. so long ago, and nobody, yeah, nobody can have a firm appreciation of it. You know, like we've, yeah, we see what happens when there's a butter, def uh, you know, <laughs> there's yeah, you know <laughs> not yeah. enough butter in the stores. Yeah. Ah! No, Snoopy's father was, he was born in 1934, so he was just a kid, a preteen, you know, when all that stuff was happening here in Norway, and um, yeah, the stories he would tell, and it's like, you know, it was always cool i put that in air quotes yeah. cool to hear the stories he would tell but you also get this chill down your spine thinking that yeah you know that that happened and it can happen again to where my children experience that kind of uh that kind of hardship it's, uh, it yeah, can it's, happen here in norway it can no absolutely can yeah uh it's yeah it's so easy to think that we're living in yeah, what is it? Civil civility, uh, civilization is a very, it's a very tenuous little agreement we got going on. The economy is the same thing, right? It's like, it, right. it only works as long as people have faith in it. You know, and as, as we see, all it took was for Putin to just, it took for one person to disregard the uh, political norms in Europe. Yeah. And now we have this thing going on in Ukraine. It's, uh, I saw, I saw, it's fragile. That balance, yeah. that peace is fragile. It's very fragile. It seems also that NATO haven't played their hand the best in this because I, I, you know, I'm not a buff on this subject at all. But I, an opinion piece I read said something like, "NATO's been very clear about we'll do this and this, but no further." Right? They've been very clear about how much they will and won't engage and help, and that basically just draws up for Putin. Like, okay, this is your free roam to reign and to do whatever you want. Yeah, but it's not so free because at the same time as NATO says they will not put any boots on the ground in but defense of Ukraine. 
we sure are sending a lot of equipment yeah. and we're seeing the effects of that. But that's factored in and he knew that. But he, there's no uncertainty about, okay, is he going too far now and are we going to join in? Like he yeah. knows for a fact, like unless we overstep the boundaries into yeah. another country, then. Yeah, but I guess I'm kind of, for me, that's reassuring to hear that NATO is not going to get involved unless Putin comes into NATO land. Yeah, and I'm sure it's a That's bit reassuring, reassuring for him as well. <laughs> well, yeah, in the sense that he feels that he can roam free and do as he pleases in Ukraine, but of course the Ukrainian resistance uh, negates his ability to freely roam through. Oh, yeah, Ukraine. obviously. I'm just talking about beyond that, you know. Yeah, but. Like engaging Ukraine is always going to be like that, right? That's sure. that's that's factored in that's going to happen when you attack a country whether europe comes in that could be a big moment of uncertainty for him and like okay is how much can we push this before yeah. we start getting the full wrath of the community yeah. but they've been very clear like no this is the boundaries and we won't engage that much i get that it's not easy and we're aiding and helping and you know but uh, i feel like they could have given him a bit more like pause and uncertainty about okay what what are the consequences going to be if i keep going at this yeah i i hear you i guess but uh, you know, you probably you you you've lived when the Cold War is still going on, so you might have yeah. a bit of a <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and also having served uh, in the U.S. Marines, I'm mm. I'm, I'm glad that NATO has been very clear about the, what they will and will not do. Okay. Uh, I don't. I would not like sitting here after however many months, two and a half, three months, yeah. wondering if if Norway yeah. is going to go to war with Russia. I would hate having right. to worry about that. I like knowing. That Norway, NATO, the United States is not going to go directly to war with Russia unless yeah. A, B, and C. Yeah. No, no. I, I, yeah, I For can. me, that's extremely reassuring. Yeah. I'm not saying I don't see the point of them doing it. I'm just saying that to some extent. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard, obviously. And it's uncharted territory. Like, there's not been a modern war for yeah. a while in, in Europe, you know. So And, and uh, yeah, Russia, how, how crazy are they willing to go within their own continent? I think Putin is sick. I believe these reports that he's got some sort of health problem. Oh, yeah? The, he doesn't the cancer look, thing? He, yeah. He, well, whether it's cancer or whatever, but I don't think he looks healthy. And he does have a steroid bloat in his face, which tells me that he's being treated for something. So maybe he has cancer or Parkinson's or whatever. Steroid bloat, huh? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I've been, I've been noticing he's a bit, a bit puffier and stuff. I just thought he was eating well. <laughs> that could be. It's been a while since I've More seen caviar. him. Seen him without a shirt on a horse, you know. Gosh, that was something, wasn't it? That? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so, yeah, it's so funny how it doesn't change. It's like I thought we were past this. This is so transparent, but apparently it still works in certain demographics. What's going to be interesting is what happens after Putin, because there's nobody in line ready to step in. So yeah. what, how, how is that going to work? You know, Russia may not know how to function without Putin. He's been there for so long. And he's had such an iron grip on everything. What's going to happen when he goes? Oh man, you're triggering me now. Making me think of Manchester United. They lost their top manager in 2015. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And just completely corroded. <laughs> <And> just felt- <laughs> oh, I'm feeling for Russia now. <laughs> I'm a red. You know, uh, that's, uh, that's what happens it's just interesting to think of what what Putin is trying to do, trying to revive the old mm. Soviet, if not politically, then geographically. And I'm trying to think: is there any legitimacy to that? To where he are we wrong for getting in the way of him wanting to restore Heck no. what used to be good for Russia? I'd say Ukraine gets to choose, <laughs> and they've had a sovereign state for long enough now. But yeah, Russia, Russia have been getting more and more impetuous, like the Georgia thing too, right in two thousand and eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then yeah, the Crimea and all that. Like they've been they've been pushing it, and uh, and uh, they'll push it me- even further. I think. Are we messing up diplomatically? What's wrong with saying, okay, Vladimir, we understand what you're trying to do. We understand your concerns. Yeah. But here's what we can do to take those concerns away yeah what if nato were to sign some sort of cooperation some sort of peace agreement we're not at war with him so we don't really need a peace agreement but what if we we sign some sort of mutual defense agreement like they tried to do was it 2004 there was talk about bringing russia into nato nothing came of it but there was talk of it what if what if nato were to bring russia in 
Well, I don't and think sign that. the papers and make them an ally. You think they'd be interested? <laughs> think of the benefits. Yeah, but that makes it. Russia that. would have no reason to believe that they're going to be attacked by NATO. I don't think they have any reason to believe that now. I think it's almost laughable but, that but, he that he puts these this word out that NATO could, you know, is 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 gathering troops to attack Russia. That's ludicrous. But you can't you can't question whether he's a rational actor one moment and then be like, well, it would make sense for him to do this, right? If he's either either he's he's on a bit, going on one and he's a bit unhinged, or he would be amenable to these things. And also, by the way, isn't this partially because we said something about the, the, the line goes this far but no further, right? Yeah. And in terms of NATO expanding into the east, they that was an un, like a I don't th I think I don't think it was there was some sort of agreement that was agreement. made, yeah. yeah. And yeah. they feel slighted. I think they probably wouldn't. They would be like, your agreements are worth shit because you've already gone beyond your remit. Yeah. I don't know. It's it, it, it's it's a it's a crazy situation. I'm just trying to think it through. Is there some sort of diplomatic path yeah. that NATO could take to to make that crazy guy relax? And I think he's a little nuts personally. Yeah, I don't think he's but interested. The, you saw Macron try a, t a shit ton. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, to try to try to get a talk going and stuff, and they just don't seem interested. It's also really fascinating to see in the beginning. It was so ludicrous to see it play out in the UN when the people were raising these issues yes. in the Security Council. Yeah. And the guy, the chairing the whole thing is from Russia. Yeah, it's like my my therapy group is being run by my rapist. What the hell, you know? I think that there's a big issue when it comes to the legitimate the legitimacy of the United Nations when yeah. you have Russia on the Permanent Security Council doing what they've been doing, not just with uh, Ukraine but Georgia, Syria. Yeah, um, yeah, they're a rogue nation when it suits them. And it, it tells me that there's something wrong with the United Nations. But it's to be fair, to be, to be fair, the U.S. has proven that ages ago as well. <laughs> How, how's that? You mean how's that? You guys have been condemned in the U.N. time oh, yeah, and time yeah, again. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, every uh, Choms as Chomsky would put it, if you go by the Nuremberg trial and the conditions laid out there, every post Second yes, World War right. president would yeah. be hanged. You're right. Yeah. Um, and you guys have uh, repeatedly said we don't care about the world court and you know vetoing you think, security council but resolutions. Think, but do you think America? Do you not think that America has gained some legitimacy by stopping all operations in Afghanistan? Now, President Biden has been criticized by that by the American right, uh, you know, leaving people behind and it was a disaster. But yeah. he did pull troops out and he did stop a war. Did he? I'm, America, I, I, America is not doing anything in Afghanistan. But stop all a war. All it, troops were taken out. Okay, so a war was... Yeah, I'm not sure exactly about what was going on in Afghanistan prior to that. Well, it was just the continued presence of American troops. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And now they're not there. Yeah. Doesn't that bring some legitimacy back to the United States? Very minute. I think it should bring a lot of legitimacy back. Because I think it was a huge mistake to have troops there for... What was it? 20... Yeah. 21 years? 20 years? Yeah. I think that's ridiculous. And I think that pulling those troops out, however late it may have been, it, it is still a significant gesture. That's the, that's it's the, more than a gesture. I mean, it's, it is a, is a concrete uh, 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 step that was taken. It's delivering on an Obama promise, sure. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know enough about it. Like, I don't know opinions in Afghanistan about it and whether they feel like they were being left to their own devices and things are worse now. Well, there's certainly, or... certainly a lot of Afghanis who believe that America kind of left them high and dry by mm -hmm. pulling the troops out. And there is a legitimate argument for that. But the troops are gone. The war that America was leading mm -hmm. is no longer being led by america doesn't that satisfy shouldn't that satisfy well, a lot of people shouldn't that bring us an element of legitimacy back maybe but i mean considering we don't the, have troops occupying yeah that country anymore we don't have troops killing innocent civilians in that country anymore yeah where there's else? no war in that country that is being conducted by america anymore yeah how many other countries do you guys have presence in stuff so? oh gosh who knows yeah well, uh, and and but does but does the world do these nations want Americans to just leave? Does yeah. Japan really want all those uh, air force and marine bases uh, on Okinawa and on mainland Japan to just leave? Do they really want that? I think if you talk about Afghanistan, they probably would say they wanted you to never have come in the first place. But now that you're here, like this is probably not the best time to leave. But but uh, 
I don't know. In the U.S., you would have to see what happens going forward. Like recent years, you guys seem to have taken on a bit more of an isolationist tack because people are sick yeah. of like there's enough issues at home that you guys don't need to be gallivanting right. around the world. Right. Trump brought that in. And I think that's been sticking since even Obama had like he did yeah. not want to get involved in Syria. Yeah. At all. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure if it gives credibility. I think it's just that you guys feel like you have less to gain from it now before like you have if you previously under bush uh you guys would use war as a way to s settle domestic unrest yes yeah and that doesn't seem to be a viable tactic now <laughs> right exactly <laughs> well you know <laughs> the occupier is going to struggle a lot more than they think yeah yeah always you know we saw it with iraq we saw it with afghanistan yeah. i think the russians are going to see it with ukraine if they're not already um, yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that I think that was a significant step yeah. uh, when President Biden took uh, the American presence out of mm. Afghanistan. I think it brought a certain element of legitimacy back to America. Mm. Now America can talk about peace because they took a huge step towards peace by by removing those troops. America can point a more legitimate finger at Russia now with what's going on in, in Ukraine because we've yeah. pulled our troops out of Afghanistan. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, def uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I it's so it's so hard to say. Like Russia is clearly way more unashamed. They don't have to. They don't have to subtly control their population, right? Putin just doesn't give. A, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think if the U.S. culture were like that, we, you, we'd you'd be seeing something quite different. Well, I think that's yeah. very important what you say. Uh, yeah. uh, for all of America's placement of troops in other countries, and, and yes, you know things happen. You know, innocent people do get killed and whatnot, but. There's a difference between an American occupation and a Russian occupation. Yeah. yeah. But I think people miss, they, they, they're missing something there. They just see American troops in other countries and they just think that that's wrong. Mm. And they put it on the same level as what we're seeing Russia do in Syria and now in, in Ukraine. Mm. There's a different way of, of American uh, uh, war actions when compared with the actions of Russia in wartime. Big difference. Yeah, how brazen it is, definitely. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, There's a very clear intention that Russia has right now, a very clear in intention, uh, you know, when it comes to harming uh, civilians. Mm. It seems like they are trying to harm as many civilians as possible as part of their war strategy to be fair if the u.s wants to do that they'll usually go with a private contractors that they can erase the traces of they'll dissolve they like, like yeah, but see now you're getting kind of into some conspiracy theory stuff yes america uses private contractors but i don't think america has ever sanctioned whether covertly or overtly sanctioned the killing of civilians no, but Whereas like, like does. the footage of people, you know, the, the bomb and then people come to help and the double tap, right? Bam. Yeah. That that was done by a bell tower or some shit, right? I think, or something I like that. I think so, yeah. yeah. And those companies, there's a record of these kind of companies going and doing whatever the heck they want and then yeah. dissolving the company and there's nobody to hold responsible and they're technically not part of the state. Yeah. It's, it's a kind of a way to do it on the low. And but you're going back to the early days of the Iraq war. <laughs> Excuse me. In, in, no, early, not, in the early 2000s, aren't the double you? Double tap, I'm talking. Yeah, 2000s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the early Iraq war. Now no, I the early old. 2000s. Yeah. yeah. That's when yeah. all these contractors were coming in yeah, and yeah. getting out of line. But that has been, to the best of my knowledge, cleaned up mm. to where it's not a, it's not a, that's just not occurring anymore. No, actually, I might, I might, yeah. You're right. I might just be uh, holding you guys to the fire a bit because of and, your, your well, trend for as decades. Should, yeah, 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 exactly. And that trend was there. And, and there were um, uh, issues with the way America was running that war in Iraq and, and in oh, no. Afghanistan. But again, we're done with that now. We've, I think we've gained some legitimacy by pulling our troops out of those places. If you ask me, an isolationist America is a better America. Yeah. I wish we didn't have any troops anywhere, period. But... Mm. They are there. Yeah. Uh, and pulling them out is as much of an action as staying in. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. I don't want to see American troops pulled out of Europe. Right now, no. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to see American troops pulled out of Japan. Why is that? Uh, because, oh, because North of Korea. North Korea, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and China. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I've been thinking that. Like, why hasn't China been going for Taiwan right now? It seems like the perfect time. Oh, I think, I think, I, I think China is, well, that, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, you know, American troops in place around the world as a peacekeeping uh, force or as a, as a, as a war deterrent, uh, I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, and see, here's, here's where I'm kind of contradicting myself. At the same time, I'll say I want... American troops here in Europe, but I don't want to see American troops having a war with Russia. I'll say that. And that is quite conflicting. Yeah. I want the safety of, but I think the world is like this as well. That's this, this is what I'm getting to. The world wants America to be the security force. Mm -hmm. You know, American troops are not being forced. We're not forcing our way into these different NATO countries or into Japan. They Mm -hmm. want us there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at the same time as they want us there, they'll also criticize us when there is a war. Mm. And I do the same thing myself. So there's a little hypocrisy there. It's a weird situation. Yeah. I don't know. The, 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 I think it's all symptom of uh, bigger issues. Like the world is so full of unrest because there's a, you know, there's a huge discrepancy in resources and how they're distributed. Right. Yes. This, this is a huge part of my white guilt. Like I know I'm at the top of the pyramid and ni- you know, what is it? Two thirds of the world live on less than two dollars yeah. a day. Yeah, that's the norm. I get that you get more for it than but in see, Norway. That's, but, where, that's yeah. where your whiteness can be of benefit to those who are not as well off as you. Oh, tell me. But white, well, I'm saying, but white guilt gets in the way of that. All you right. know, maybe not you as an individual, but if you're a uh, uh, some wealthy corporate guy, mm. and you suffer from an extreme case of white guilt. Yeah. So you keep your mouth shut about, about all the social and economic ills that you see. Mm. You're wasting your whiteness because you as a some big Fortune 500 executive, you could also be a mouthpiece mm. that brings awareness to these social and economic inequalities. Mm. But if you suffer from white guilt, you'll never speak on it. Yeah, I don't... It's a waste of whiteness. It's a waste of whiteness, yeah. Uh, waste of a lack of melanin. I want white people to get active. I want people to be a, a mouthpiece uh, when appropriate. I want people, white people to drop that guilt thing and become an ally and be more active. That's much more productive. It would be. But, uh, like, if we're talking about CEOs and stuff like that, right, they have, like, the way systems are formed, you have an obligation to shareholders to maximize profit and stuff like that, right? Yeah, but, but they also want to see you doing good things. A yeah, lot of usually, charity work and being a mouthpiece yeah. for causes, people like that as well. Often, often for tax breaks, uh, you know, for tax alleviation and to rehabilitate image, right? Yeah. Like uh, the Qataris owning football clubs and stuff like that to, right. to sports wash their money and rainbow washing. And like there's so many yeah. causes you can join just to make your company seem like it's <sighs> not, you know. Like Nestle, I'm sure Nestle do nice stuff. Okay, they also yeah, take drinking yeah, water from people. Yeah, and those those you know? people and those corporations are are, are disingenuous. They're, there's no honesty in what they're doing. They're doing it for the sake of image. But I'm talking about the corporate guy, the white guy or woman yeah. who has a lot of money, uh, enough money to where they can actually make positive change that is felt on a global basis. I, I wonder how many of them are doing less than they could because of white guilt, because oh, yeah. they listen to a black woman or a black man who says, "This isn't your fight. Have a seat." Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, and again, I, I, I'm the opposite. I want white people to be more vocal. <laughs> Chris Rock puts this into his comedy a lot, or when he's being interviewed, he'll say that, uh, uh, you know, in, in his humorous way, he's basically saying that true change is not going to come until true change affects white people. White people have to change in order for the, the social ills, the economic ills and the inequalities in America are made. Well, you, you see stuff like the, the, the drug epidemic in the U.S. didn't yeah. get taken seriously until opioids started in going into white areas. That is a perfect and, example. Yeah. yeah. So there's not going to be true change Skin unless in white game. people get in the game. Yeah. So I don't want them silent. I don't want them... Yeah. Inactive. My point, though, uh, earlier on the whole thing is that, you know, if you want to do something good, if you want to change things, like charities, okay, that's fine. I can help alleviate some things. But if you want to actually stop the slide we're on right now, we'd need to see corporations changing their modus operandi. And anybody who tries to do that, they'll be replaced. Like, it's a system. And any one person that tries to change something, they'll just be persona non grata. 
And I think that's really hard to change. I feel like we're going to need torches and guillotines before this really gets changed. (laughs) You want to see a revolution. (laughs) I kind of do, yeah. Yeah. Before the world's burning a bit harder. I wonder, do you think that's going to happen in our lifetime? The world is falling apart? Or Uh, that significant change, that revolution, that uh, world war maybe? No, I don't think so. No? I think we're going to be on a... my my main main concern is climate change. Yeah. Like this is again goes back to the whole thing. I want to make a, do a bit about this. I get together with girls who are very smart in fields that rob you of all hope. Because <laughs> uh, another one I was with, she did a PhD in climate change. Yeah. And the stuff she told me made me go like, God damn, this is it's scary. It's huge. And there's a 50 year lag between CO2 emissions and the effects of it. So what we're seeing right now, this is this is the 70s talking right now. Yeah, and there's people saying it's too late. Yeah, uh, and it probably, I mean, that's defeatism, right? Like, you can always it do is, better. It is, but it may also be the science. Yeah, sure. You know? Well, scientists don't agree that it's too late, but we're definitely getting there. What do they say if something's not done? It, what is that, Par- the Paris Accord? Um, when is that supposed to kick? Was it 2025? Yeah. They're saying by 2025 we have to cut... Uh, uh, I think we need to roll back emissions by then. It has yeah. that peaked, and then we have to be going down. But it's year on year, it's going up. And the more, the it's more, scary. the more caps are disappearing. The more less reflective surface you have, the more heat gets trapped. Then you get these banks of methane gas under the water surface that now get heated up and released. And then yeah. you get methane in there, which traps heat way more effectively than CO two. Yeah. And then you get these feedback loops going. And, uh, yeah, like a nor- Earth turned into a snowball at one point. This is probably going to be the opposite way. I'm hoping, I'm hoping like uh, Joe Rogan would say, I'm hoping those clever monkeys are going to innovate their way out of it, <laughs> capture some carbon. Yeah. But uh, I'm not hopeful. We're going to have to get to uh, – the brinksmanship is right now is like, let's get as much money out of this as we can before we really have to change. It's yeah. like an addict. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a scary situation. I wish more people took it seriously. It's partially why I'm choosing to use my gifts to get funny. <laughs> Because it feels like it's not you worth... Laugh, laugh your way into the abyss. I could get a real career, invest into a dying world, or I could get my laughs in. That's uh, that's pretty much where I'm at. Do you have a plan to make money from comedy? Like like steps to get there? No. Right now I'm just thinking about getting funnier. Yeah. And then when the time's right, I'm going to poke my head out and actually try to draw attention to myself but right now it's just about failing anonymously but you but you have this defeatist attitude how are you ever going to get to the point where you know without having a concrete plan i'm not i mean how are you ever going to get there because you're always going to be held back by your defeatism that you that you direct inward yeah well i mean okay the plan is this to just keep getting stage time get funny keep getting bigger rooms and then at some point, I'm going to be like, I'm funny enough to take this on the road to book some places for myself and see if I can fill them and yeah. make people laugh. And I'll just have to take that chance. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, but I, I feel like it'll happen naturally. Like, I get more and more brave as it goes. And like last, uh, let me, uh, comedy wise, a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to do an English gig uh, yeah. at Salt at uh, Long Houston, which is seats like 100, 120. And the show was, uh, called Failing in Love. Failing in Love. Yeah. I asked about it. Like, I was asked, can you do a show on Monday? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I checked on Monday. What are the listings? And the only English language show I could find was Failing in Love. Yeah. And I'm like, a show about women and comedy. And, and I'm like, do I have to do jokes? Is it this show? And do I have to do jokes about love and relationships? And she's like, no, yes. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Turns out she she was totally screwing with me, and it's like, no, it is that show, and yes, you got to do that material. And I found that out two days before. Oh man! And I'm like, I don't have dating material. I don't have love material. What, really? What did you do then? I made some. Just improvised. <laughs> no, I, I I had two days to think about it. Okay, yeah. And uh, I have some other joke, uh, other uh, uh, jokes and stuff that I could tie in that so, are loosely related. But so, it was. So how did the show go then? It went pretty well. I opened. They asked me to do like, I showed up and I didn't know how much I was supposed to do. And he said, 10, 15 minutes if you want to. And I'm like, 10 minutes of this related stuff. I'm not sure if I can do it. Wound up doing 15. That's a confidence booster. Yeah, no, it was. And I was, I've never been this calm and collected and slow on stage. I was taking my time. I went up on stage and I said, I found out recently that this show was, a couple of days ago, I found out that this show was supposed to be around love. So I've been spending the past week trying to unrepress some memories. 
Uh, I'm not sure I found any jokes, but I did have an emotional breakthrough. <laughs> That's how I open. And uh, I had a good time. It was fun. 15 minutes on love and relationships. I, I, I could do that. Part of it was just me being self-deprecating and doing me jokes yeah. about how, uh, you know, and, and framing them as this is this is why it's hard for me to date. Yeah. So, it, and and somebody caught on to that. I, I read, I got my first review and she's like, I didn't seem to get the memo. And I'm like, I got it two days before. <laughs> All didn't right. Didn't get the memo. <laughs> didn't get the memo. <sighs> but uh, he told me vaguely related. That'll do. I have roughly, and, and I've been checking some stuff that I had written and listening to some of my old uh uh, uh, recordings. I, I've, I've always recorded myself Yeah, same. and, um, I have a little bit of material on politics. I have maybe 10 minutes on politics. I have maybe 15 minutes on being black in Norway and I have roughly 12, 12 and a half minutes on just on Snoopy. Yeah. Relation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationship stuff with her. I love your Snoopy material. <laughs> yeah. So, so does she. <laughs> so does she. She hasn't heard it all though. Yeah. I've played little snippets of it for her. my my hope is that one time or one day she will come uh, to see me perform and then just experience this this horrible horrible material that I that she has given me <laughs> by just being herself and then let her hear seeing it how you frame style. it unfairly yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> Oh man, it's so much fun. No, I, I I felt ten feet tall for a week after that. I had that afterglow and stuff. Isn't that a good feeling? But it's when so funny. It goes well, and you just carry that good feeling with you for a while. But I had a realization. A lot of people talk about. I don't know what it's like for you, but a lot of people talk about how on stage they're just focused and they're not thinking much, and then they get off stage and they feel a huge relief. Uh, it's, oh no, no, yeah, no, same. No, I no. have fun on stage and yes. I get off and I'm like. How did that actually go? And I'm trying to rack my brain a bit. That is exactly what I do. I yeah. will immediately, as soon as I'm like, thank you, good yeah. night, I immediately start evaluating. Yeah, I mean, yeah. How did that actually go? Yeah, yeah. I was busy doing something. I'm not sure. And I'll go I'll go home and I'll turn on my yeah. phone and listen yeah. to the recording. I'm like, ah, I didn't hit that one yeah. right. Or, oh, wow, that was an improvisation that I need to build. Yeah. On. So it, it's this analytical process. It's never relief. It's like, okay, yeah. now the job begins because I'm going to, evaluate this and that's going to yeah. put me back into the writing mode yeah the yeah work, you know yeah so there's no relief apparently there's a lot of people who go like they feel relief after they go on stage like they don't enjoy it being on stage but afterwards that wave of relief is nice and i'm like i usually don't feel that but yeah. after that show i felt it because okay yeah because i was doing new material i don't have a set list with me i did yeah. had it in my pocket but you're supposed to not go off your notes because people yeah. had paid 250 a pop and yeah you know, yeah. proper show. I felt like a... Fr and the dude went on stage. He's a Romanian comedian who's been touring Europe for three years. Oh, wow. And he knows his shit. And he was on stage for half an hour, 40 minutes or so, warming him up. And I was just like, God, this guy's legit. Yeah. I'm a fraud. And I'm supposed to go up. And I went up. And it went all right. I flubbed one bit. I did a Ukraine joke nobody liked. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I should have just said, man, I should have expected that to bomb. But I, 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 just go, <laughs> I got flummoxed because this chick went, oh. Oh. <laughs> she did that twice. Oh no! And I was like, "All That's right, not... we're moving on from this one." I didn't even complete the joke. I completely spaced on it. But but uh, yeah, after after I went off stage, you can hear me on the, my recording just as I go through the curtain, and you hear me go, "Fuck!" <laughs> and I I just realized at that moment, doing a big stage like that in front of people, it's like it's good because they're a fluffed crowd. They've yes. paid. They're yeah. here to laugh, yeah. and it's it's a very easy crowd compared to an open mic. Yeah, but. Uh, it's it's like getting a penalty in, in soccer. It's like yeah, you get to shoot a penalty uh, kick, and it's like if you score, you're great, but come on, you're supposed to. Like, well, and if you miss, then you're an asshole. Those those open mic nights are rough, but we have to do them because that's where we come up with our ideas. That's where our, where we first test our ideas. Yeah, yeah. When you get on a, a, a non-open mic stage, uh you know, that's, you're not in the big leagues, but it's a step up. Yeah. So how long do you have to be on these 50 to 100 seater crowds before you're going to start booking stuff on your own? How long do you have to be in this, this uh, level? I, 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 because I think, and I asked because I think you've already proven that you can do that. Well, you were telling me about your gigs, you know, last year in Bergen when you and Anthony went out there. And I'm like, oh, this guy's, you know, I think is ready to. The second night there went terrible. <laughs> yeah, you said that. Yeah, but you had you did have a good night. Yeah. So how many of those good nights do you have to have before you push yourself up to the next level? I mean, 
I don't, I don't know. I think I'll feel it. Like it's, it's. Uh, see, it, that's why I'm challenging you because <laughs> if you keep going by this, oh, I'll feel it. But you're also a defeatist. You also, you also. You're saying you, I you, won't feel it. Well, you're you're good at at uh, digging up uh, things that are wrong with yourself and with what you do, and that can. You can sit in that situation for so long that you never have any concrete plans. I'm the opposite of a troubleshooter. This is true. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. But I think me being in my head and all that stuff, but with stand-up, I push myself out of my comfort zone all the time. That's what you stand-up do? is yeah. to begin with. So yeah. like the fact that I dare to book and ask to do a spot yeah. in Bergen and it legit and go up and, and it's the a fact, big deal yeah and doing that salt thing too like okay yeah. i'll open fine i'll open yeah. even though i don't know if these jokes work they're new yeah. and one of them i was so happy with it's like a real bit it's like a two-minute story about this chick <laughs> i went on a date with who was an anti-vaxxer it turned out <laughs> <laughs> and and it worked and i was like god damn i, I yeah. can't believe it and but it's uh, it's so unreliable still i feel like when you see, see yeah. when you see when you see a proper comic waltz into a room and take the mic and start talking, you can yeah. just tell that this yeah. guy, his cadence, his voice, he's funny. He's not even in material yet, but you like him right off the bat. I I have a hard time connecting with my audience at times. Who do you see out there, a Norwegian comedian, mm. who you think has been too long? At this level. Oh, without taking a step up? Without taking a step up. That's a good question. Um, one of my one of my absolute freaking favorites who always makes me laugh and makes me wonder, like, how is he not taking a step up is a guy called Francisco Briseno. Okay. He's, I know him. he's half Chilean, half Norwegian, I think, and and uh, he's got a Christian Sand accent, really, you know, laid back, smooth. Yeah. Out and and, uh, and he just, he's, 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 he, I don't know. He's like Hedbergian to me. He's like yeah. he seems so silly, but he's got this intensity at the same time. And so, what do you think is his reason for not moving moving up? I don't know. He probably has the same imposter syndrome as everybody else, and goes like, "I'm not ready yet. Uh, I'm not ready yet." You know, you're right. I should, I should, I should have like a spelled out. Yeah, yeah, I should have yeah. a spelled out plan. But I don't know, man. I feel like I'm working on so many things in my life. I feel like also booking a place. I don't have the money for that. So, like, if if uh, I I need to get to a place where I can have the discretionary spending where it doesn't, it, I'm not in debt because I yeah. tried to chance a right. venue. Right. So I'm I'm working on a lot of different stuff, and but right now I'm three years in. I'm a baby. It's still early, yeah. It's still Absolute early. baby. There's people who've been at it for uh, ten years and still feel like they got nothing to do on a real stage. And uh, I'm trying not to be that guy. I do have it's it's so weird. I'm the most insecure fucking person in a lot of ways, <laughs> but and same goes for my stand up. But I also have a there's also a part of me that goes like, if there's any way to do this, I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna stop until it's been it's been proven to me that this is just a stupid uh you know vain effort. Yeah. Uh, so I think I have more confidence. It just comes in. It comes in little. It comes in little jolts, and uh, I I do a push. I book myself for something I probably shouldn't, and uh, it goes the way it goes. You know what you should do? You want to talk about pushing yourself? You should go ahead and book, like, one show a month. Mm -hmm. Bo start booking now. Book one show a month for the next four months, mm -hmm. and tell yourself that at each booking you're going to do entirely new material oh right that would push me to write that would push you to write once a month where it's just okay this is this is a new material yeah. evening and then if you don't get the crowd response in other words if if uh if you if you go in the minus yeah. financially it's only one time yeah per month you can afford that and the uh, the I'm guessing you can afford that. I'm just yeah. assuming. Yeah. And I could bring some other funny comics in. Ex exactly. Yeah. But it will give you the confidence of actually standing up for yourself because, yeah, it is rough to book something. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. I, I, I booked a show, uh, a music show. There were uh, two um, different bands uh, that played at Drummond's Theater. You yeah. Know, that's big time. But I booked it and I did it. Yeah. I made money, but oh my God, was it scary. Yeah. But oh my God, was I confident afterwards. Right. Because it worked, it made money. I said I'd do it, I did it. Exactly. Yeah. So that will give you some confidence. If you book for the next four months, just one show each month, uh, you're going to get that confidence because it is scary and ballsy to book something for yourself. Uh, but you're also going to be forced to write because you're going to tell yourself that you're going to do all new material 
each of those four months. And then after those four months, what you do, because you're going to record all this, you, you take the best material from each show that you did mm. and take maybe f- 15 minutes from each show that yeah. is the best and combine that into one act. Then you book that one act yeah. for four months. So we're talking about an eight, maybe a nine month period where you've booked yourself to perform eight times. Now that doesn't say that you don't use open mic or whatever smaller yeah, yeah, yeah. gigs to practice, but you have over eight months, you've consolidated the best out of four shows into an hour's worth of material, mm-hmm. which you then perform that same material four times where you've booked it yourself. I bet you could then at that point feel confident enough to film after four months, after, I'm sorry, after eight months, to film a solid hour of comedy, just you, mm-hmm. just you, and film it and put it out there and sell it. And all of a sudden you're a comedian after by that time it'll be four years where you're actually filming your own one hour special. Yeah. Don't say that that can't be done because it can. No, I'm sure it could be, but I think... Doing stand-up is hard, man. 15 minutes. Sure, sure it is. I was tired after 15 minutes. Sure, I bet you were. And I had moments where I, f- like, I think to, to engage for a full hour in a special, that is, that's hard. Uh, but and if you practiced for eight, nine months, don't you think that you're good enough to where you could do that? If you have that as your goal. See, right yeah. now, you don't think you could do it because you don't really have a goal. You're just kind of just doing stand-up. But if you have a concrete goal with a timeline, and, and measurable steps yeah. during that timeline, measurable steps. You Do you truly think that you would not be able to put an hour together? No, I'm sure I could put an hour together. I'm just not sure I would want it on wax. You know, I'm not sure I want that pers- preserved for posterity. I have a feeling that there's still so freaking much to learn that I Of course there I is, but that's only your first special. And then you do another one and you just get better. I'm not sure I want that as my first special. No, uh, Why not? Because I don't feel, I just don't feel ready. I really don't. Of course you're not ready, but I just mapped out a plan for you where for nine months. See, I'm not going to let you go. I just mapped out a plan where you will work for nine months. Yeah. Four months where you where you uh, put your show together. Yeah. One month where you then take 10, 15 minutes from each of those, plus a little more, more material to where you get a solid hour, and then you take that hour for four months. Yeah. That's nine months altogether, and at the end of that, you have a product. Yeah. Not just the special, but the product is you. You are now a seasoned comic who's not afraid to book for himself. You're a seasoned comic who knows how to write with a with a specific purpose in mind. I could also Can you imagine how powerful you would be as a stand-up if you did that. That's if you if it, with a lot of goodwill, yeah, I could imagine that. But I could also picture myself being a guy who's put out a special show, showing a guy who has too much confidence in himself and can't quite carry it yet, and that's yeah, going to be an impression that sticks. Yeah, but what is too much confidence? See, this is the Yantolov in Norwegian. Talk. No, no, no. This is me recognizing that I'm a, th- as far as comedy goes, I'm three years old. I've barely okay. learned how to put together sentences. So, and, and again, how do you grow from that? If you just keep repeating what you're doing now at a certain point, if you look at it from a training <clears throat> aspect, if you bench, every time you go in, you bench 100 kilos. Yeah eventually you're going to lose the training effect of that 100 kilos. It's going to be too light. But that's not what I'm doing, though. I'm uh, every, every year I feel like I'm, I'm going further and further up in, in weight yeah. class. Like uh, doing those two shows in Bergen last year at mm-hmm. Ule Bull, you know, and my first, the second one where I, I choked, essentially, was uh, like it seats 400, 130 yeah. showed up. So, but yeah. they all were all concentrated in front of the stage. It was good. Yeah. And it's like a mezzanine, like a second tier yeah. and stuff. And it's like, holy shit. My brain freaked out on me. It's like, yeah. you've never done this before. Yeah. And I wigged out. And, and uh, like, but I pushed myself and I did it. I learned something from it. Like, and that was something I hadn't done in years before. Right. right. So every year I feel like I'm putting myself out there and I'm, I'm growing and I'm getting better. But it's going to take a while. And I, I don't want to shoot my shot too soon. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm just afraid that you're going to get so caught up in your lack of confidence in yourself that you're going to give up. No, that's not going to happen. No. Uh, how do you know? How do I know? Because this is, um, I, used, I didn't say you didn't have any self-confidence. You said that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. So how do you, how do you know? 
I know because this this feels different to me. Like I went 34 years of my life before discovering that it's fun to be on a stage and do stand up. I had stage mm -hmm. fright. I, you know, anxiety, it was terrible. My legs would shake and stuff in the beginning yeah, and yeah. like I was I thought I was not made for that at all. And now it's something I'll do on the regular and I've done. Yeah. And I I used to think I wanted to be a musician. But really? Yeah. I yeah. I play guitar. I, I, I used to record like on Fruity Loops. I'd sample and make drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'd add a bass track. And then yeah. I'd add some guitar and sometimes vocals. Like I got a SoundCloud and shit. And, uh, but I, I, I reached like a plateau where I was like, eh, I don't need to learn how to sweep. I don't need theory and all that stuff. And I just reached a comfortable plateau and that was it. And I never pushed myself to go on stage much. I did it a few times. And I just never had that drive, and I just reached that point and like, okay, that's good enough for a yeah. hobby. With stand-up, it's different. With stand-up, I'm you gonna, want more out of this. I am gonna kill this as much as I can. Okay, maim it at the very least. Yes. No, it's it's it feels so different to me. It's yeah. it feels. And well, that's good to hear because I think you're great at it, and I think you've got a future ahead of you. Thank you. I do, and that's why I threw that little plan out there. You want me to see I, me get firm with it? Yeah. Well, well, yeah, because I worry about because you. <sighs> You're so down on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, that's a good quality in your yeah. comedy. It is. Yeah. A lot of comics have that streak. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, for you, it's more the. it's not a streak. It's like a <laughs> brick wall. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I, I, I worry about you, Eric. Yeah. No. Yeah. That makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you have a solid plan, if you've got it mapped out and it's going to work for you, then then that's, it. yeah, it's going to work for you. This is part of my problem in life in general. I don't tend to have really firm plans. They right. make me a bit, they I make my that. soul yeah. squirm a bit. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. see that. I prefer to intuit my way through things, and it's not working out, is it? But um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to find that balance now. I find, I think a lot of people who do comedy, though, they have good careers going on on the side. Yeah. They can never take that step because there's something yeah. they're holding on to. When the time comes, I will be jumping. Okay. Because I don't, I'm just going to try not to advance my career too much before then. So I don't I have see. much to lose. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like the way I am as a person, I feel like once I feel like I can carry it, I'm, I'm not going to be held back. I don't think I'm going to take the chance. So that, that day will come then. Yeah. The fact that I just went on a stage in the first place, being me is, says a lot about how, how much I want this. And uh, I'm usually not, the only thing I'm cocky about is my English uh, and language skills in general. I'm pretty damn good at English. Your English is perfect. I know. And, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, uh, stand-up too is one of those things where I'm like, some days I'm like, I'm not funny, I'm a fraud. But I'll, I, I, at the but same time, I'm like. That's I, healthy to yeah. have those moments. Yeah. I think any creative. Self -eval yeah, yeah. Where you evaluate yourself and your art. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, if I if I didn't have those qualities, it would mean that I don't have a lot of insight into myself. Well, it's healthy to recognize yeah. where you're lacking when it comes to art, yep. whatever the art is, yep. because when when you acknowledge that, if you're a true artist, you're going to take steps to to turn that into something that's that's part of your foundation. Yeah. So that's just healthy. But uh, back to back to why I'm not taking that step just yet is like there's f certain feedbacks I get, and I still get this regularly. Like um, if a bit doesn't go well. Like, don't be apologetic in your body language or what yeah. you say, right? Uh, certainly don't try to blame the audience for it. Like, that can be done in a funny way. Yeah. More often than not, it'll come across as passive-aggressive. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard that a number of times. Uh, trying to be charming and funny about it, and it's like, p that came across as passive-aggressive. And that shows that there's a disconnect between what I think I'm projecting yeah. and what I am actually projecting. You said a few minutes ago you had said something in your routine, and there's a woman who was like, oh. Yeah. Threw me I, off. Oh, but I love that. That's when I'll. That's when I'll go totally off yeah. the plan and start improvising and find out why. I'll. I'll ask them. What's what? What? What's up? And yeah. just feed off of that. Yeah. This yeah. is why you do all right with crowd work, and I oh, get. I, I love, get wigged I, out. Yeah. I love the crowd work. Uh -huh. The best. The best show I ever did uh, was opening for uh, Zahid Ali out mm. in uh, Myeongdong, and uh, I think I had like my closer yeah and then only half of my little closing story everything else was improvised crowd work yeah because they were so um there's so much life in them yeah and this these women in the front row and all of a sudden i, I just was going to me crowd work is where it's at you could make hay oh yeah. absolutely 
Oh, crowd, Absolutely. crowd work is great. It shows that you're in the room, you know, and yeah. you can't just take that across town. Well, but then it's also difficult when, you know, at our level of stand up, if you have an open mic night and there's yeah. 10 people there. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's not the same. There's not much to feed off of right there. And then that's the, the worst shows I've ever d- done have the fewest amount of people there to yeah. see it. Yeah. You know, I need I need more of a feedback type of thing. If I, that's my weakness as a stand up, yeah. if the crowd is not full of energy, yeah, uh, but in numbers, yeah. you know, I no, it's tough. I just lose my. I don't know what I lose. I lose my. Well, it's like yeah, there's not enough people here for me to make laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't trigger that chemical reaction. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It can't reach critical mass. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. yeah, I know I know exactly what you mean. Like uh three is not a crowd in comedy. You know, and, <laughs> and some people say, Well, you need those nights where there's oh, yeah. five people in the audience and I guess you do, but I I I guess you do, but I don't. I think <laughs> no, I, 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 I can't I can't do it. I just you, can't make it work when there's I think not a lot of people. If you send a top comic in yeah. Somebody who really knows their shit. People don't even have, need to know who it is, right? It could be yeah. just somebody who's really good at it, has been doing it for a long time, doesn't have a huge name. They'll get those five people rolling, like as if they were a room. I think if you're good enough. If you're good enough, yeah. yeah. And see, and, that, and that's my weakness. I'm not good enough. I don't have, I'm, I'm too dependent on vibe. Yeah. Energy in the room. I'm too dependent if on that, If they're not already having a good time. Y- yeah. 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 Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's a numbers thing. If it's below a certain amount of people, I just look and I see an empty room and I'm like, ah, yeah. And I go into my routine with that attitude. Ah, yeah. You're not excited to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. And it just doesn't work. Like a teacher that doesn't care about their subject. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think, uh, it's it's so freaking subtle and and you liking to do crowd work and stuff like that. I wish I wish I could get better at that, but it's something I need to keep consciously in my head cuz when that woman went my joke was essentially that <laughs> I was so happy with this. This is something I've been wanting to do for a while. I started off by going like uh so recently I decided to take my life more seriously and uh <laughs> I started working out. <laughs> I started talking about that and I yeah. talk about how sots is making it hard for me cuz when I go work out in the morning on the treadmill, I see on the screens the morning shows, and they're baking a cake. <laughs> Every time they're baking a cake or something, yeah. and I'm supposed to be, you know, it's, yeah. like, it's like going to church trying to be a spiritual person. It's like <laughs> there's porn on the monitors. What's going on? <laughs> I'm trying to be a good person. And I, I and then I said I was kind of happy when the Ukraine war broke out, and then you just hear, oh, and the rest of the room's completely silent. And I flipped out. I, I I wigged out. I didn't know how to respond to it. Yeah. I was so thrown off. Yeah. That what I said was, oh no, are you from Ukraine or, and just <laughs> no again. And I'm like I'm not, and I said I'm not going to apologize unless you're from Ukraine. <laughs> and and then, <laughs> still nothing. Oh, it was such an awkward moment, and I just moved on. Uh, I was going to say I, it made me relieved because then I they pushed the cakes off the TV, and you know it kind of made more sense to have war on TV than cakes. See, and that's heavy when. That, that's why doing crowd work is kind of bold. Yeah, because. If the crowd does not want to be worked, then you you look like an idiot, really. But this uh, this was me. And that's happened to me a couple of times. Yeah. I try And I don't get the response. Yeah. But I could I could have been I could. There's a number of things I could have done if I if my if my head was with me a bit more. I didn't lose my shit completely. After I moved on, it was fine. Yeah. I got got him back. Yeah. But but uh, I should have just said something like, well, you know, wait to see where the joke's going first. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. It might not or be just that bad. Order. Just kept- or I should have known that a Ukraine joke would bomb, you know, yeah. something. But something. instead, I'm like, yeah. And that was, uh, when I listen, I don't, uh, part of me doesn't want to listen back to that set. It was a good set. I liked it. But halfway through, I know, like, oh, here's where yeah. I go. Here's where I lose my shit. And I, yeah. I don't know how to respond. And I feel weird about it. And I'm like, okay, this is why I won't book a room for myself just yet. Because <laughs> clearly, I haven't been in the situation where you, you've handled well, everything. Well, yeah, and that's what it is. It's, it's uh, experience. Yeah. To where you have handled just about everything, and and with all these lockdowns, it's been so hard to get into the stream of it. I was like, just going to say it's been difficult for anybody, regardless yeah. of how good a comic or how experienced a comic you were. This yeah. these last two years, man, with COVID and yeah. the shutdown, it's hurt all of us. Because yeah, what are you? And for and for those who continue doing stand up online or uh, by video online and stuff, okay, you can stay somewhat sharp, but still. Yeah, it's not going to make it's, you stage ready. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, I was going to say uh, there was a long period, there was like a six-month period where I was 
not trying new shit on stage because there's so few there's so few gigs I was doing that I was like I don't want to risk I want to feel good about this set so let's try yeah let's do tried and true shit and it's only like in the last couple of months where I've gotten to a place where like okay I feel comfortable on stage again and now I'm like let's rattle off a joke if it doesn't work that's fine you know I think you should do you should do that nine month plan (laughs) yeah as long as it takes to take make a baby, that's how long it takes to get my career off the ground. There, you're thinking you're gonna birth a comedy special. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna have congenital defects. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Hey, listen. Yeah. Uh, we gotta wind this up. Snoopy yeah. is coming home uh, soon. Yeah. I gotta make her lunch. Uh, she's working th- three, not a double, three shifts in a row. Whoa. She's uh, she's a tough little woman. Clearly, what what feel is she's in health? Nurse, yeah, 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 psychiatric yeah. nurse. Damn, it's a uh, interesting field to be in. Good on you. Yeah, no, definitely be a champ and make her some lunch. A champ or a chump? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Um, so what's what's coming up then? Do you have any uh, uh, non open mic gigs? Do you have a yeah a planned thing with a maybe with a a, a, a duo or a trio? Several comics? Yeah, I I got three gigs set up uh, currently. Next Thursday, I'm going to be in a place called Lernskog doing a thing. There's three comics, uh, Eirik Krukos, and Chris, no, what was his name? Like, I don't know, Christian something or other. Like, there's a, there's a, Sandra Spjelkevik's another one. There's three proper comics, and then there's a bunch of, what three they, proper, and then a bunch of wannabes. That, that's exactly <laughs> what it says. They spell wannabe with two E's, though, and I'm like, mm, oh, are not you a B. Did they write wannabes? Really? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to pick on him about that, but nobody likes that guy. Nobody cares. Everybody knows what they mean. <laughs> but, no, but I should come and see that. It's been a long time since I saw a show. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be me and a, I don't know who the other rookie comics mm-hmm. are going to be, but it's probably going to be some people I know from Oslo. And Lauren Skoog. Yeah, no. that's, that's next Saturday around 637. Oh. And then on the Saturday, there's uh, Rock Against Cancer. Rockmutkraft. Okay. Yeah, I got this through a friend. He said that they were arranging a Rock Against Cancer gig, and uh, they wanted some comics to warm up. And where is that going to be? That's going to be at a place called Krösset. Okay. K R Ö S S E T. Okay. Ö is the symbol for Boran, if anybody's unsure. <laughs> Boran. Yeah. So those are the two I got now this month, and then um, on a, uh, June third, I'm doing a place called Uhurst in Oslo. Um, okay. So that's a nice little intimate venue. Yeah. So that's all I got right now. I should I should be booking more, but it's uh, I had a rough <laughs> week last week, and part of me part of me I start punishing myself and just going like, let's not do anything. I want to pity well, myself you for know, a week. But, yeah, but that's that's okay though to have take a week. Like, yeah, yeah, chill out for a little while. I used to take a year or two, but now it's, <laughs> I, I'll take a week out, and then it's like. Okay, dust yourself off. This never helped anybody. Part of planning, though, is scheduling your rest periods, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I think the first lockdown was helpful in that sense because I would have just kept going every week. Yeah. And you get tunnel vision sure, and stuff. Sure, sure. I think that break made me go like, okay, let's reevaluate, let's settle Did down you a write, bit. write a little bit oh, more? Oh, I wrote maybe? tons. No? I was yeah. on an online Discord server, like a, a server usually used by gamers and stuff. And we made this group of guys. We still talk. It's like yeah. uh, th- two guys from Dallas, a guy from Michigan, a cool. guy from Colorado, and me and Anthony. Cool. And uh, Anthony wasn't there then. But like the, during the first lockdown, we had like a group where we was like, write three jokes a day. Yeah. Shitty, good, bad, whatever. Just write them. And we wrote them. And I got a lot of material out of it. And that we had a lot cool. of fun. And then we stopped doing it. <laughs> I use I use Snoopy and the Babies for my material. Seriously. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'll... I might add curse words or make it more uh, lewd and whatnot for, for when I'm actually on stage. But generally, the first ideas that I get, I'll test it out on them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so I, you could say I got a lot of that done during the lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Because we were, yeah, the kids weren't going to school; they were doing school here at home, so we were all together. So that's a lot of writing. Are they good surrogates for the crowd? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, basically, if it's something that. Snoopy gets offended by, then I keep it. <laughs> I like it. Oh, that's funny. So I'm going to put those dates and where you're going to be uh, in the description of this episode so that people can come out and support you. Yeah, I'd link you on Facebook, but... <laughs> oh, gosh, you see? That's mean. <laughs> that's just mean. No, I, I don't miss it. I don't miss Facebook good, at good. all. Good, uh, good. Don't. <laughs> it's it's uh, sad that there's some individuals I can't get in touch with, but 
all in all, not being on there is actually, actually a good thing. Yeah, I'm writing there... a book, man, so I'm doing more writing on that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, man. Listen, everybody, this guy, you got to watch out for him because he's coming. Uh, he's getting better and better as he goes. Um, and he's a great conversationalist, as you guys can see. So this is Idik Sudvik. Uh, check him out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, check him out whenever he's doing a show in your area. Twitter and face, uh, Twitter and Instagram. What did I say? Twitter? No, no, sure. Instagram. I, I don't use Twitter really. Yeah, Instagram and Facebook and Instagram. But I have an handle on both of those, which is Wikipedia. I C K Y P E D I A. That's my Instagram Wikipedia. for anybody that wants to follow. Usually pictures of me going to the gym and the occasional meme and gig updates. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you get. <laughs> Listen, man. I uh, as usual, I enjoyed the conversation. Same. Um, you should have your own show, man. <laughs> I'm serious. I think you're a great conversationalist. If you were to start your own little podcast, sky's the limit. I come back to that in my head every once in a while. The man. fact that you said it, so it's it's one it's of my there. most popular episodes. Two of them, actually. One is the one episode called "Who Is John Allen," where you interviewed me for like right. two hours and twenty minutes, and. Uh, like a 10 minute clip that I made from that episode mm. uh, where I was speaking specifically about something I was doing. Mm. So you are at the top of all of my episodes when it comes to views on YouTube and listens on the podcast platform. So that that's a testament to how good of a conversationalist you are. I could flip it, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Bye everybody.